But I've never in, in Europe heard people talk as much about white people as I do like in, for some people in the United States. Because in Europe, the, there is no such thing as like white ethnic lines. Like there are white people that hate other white people. That's like a very Americanized term. So I, I guess, um, and then when you talk about later on about how there's like these group ethnic identities. So I think that, I don't know how, where you draw these lines out, but I would say something that's been very frustrating to me in the Democratic Party is, and, and I, I'm not accusing you, but it sounds like you're, you're making the same, what I would say like a, an error in thought is that we have very clear like white people, Asian people, black people, Hispanic people. And Democrats f up all too often labeling. We are going to be debating immigration and the changing demographics. So let's bring on our guests. First up, let's bring on Sean Last. How are you? Doing all right. How are you? Doing good. So yeah, if you want to introduce yourself, tell people where you lie on the political spectrum and where people can find you. Uh, yeah, so I'm Sean Last on Twitter and YouTube. Politically, I take positions that are left and right, depending on the issue. But the stuff we're talking about today, basically all far right wing positions. Um, okay. Was there another question? No, I think you got it. <laughs> all, right. <laughs> all right. Thanks. Um, next up, let's bring on Destiny. How are you? Hey, I'm doing good. So, yeah, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, my name is Destiny or Steven. I do typically like center left or far left content, depending on what we're talking about. And in this conversation, I imagine I'm going to be presenting a center left argument. Okay, great. All right, so here's what we're going to do. Each person can give an opening statement, can be as little as one minute, no longer than five, about the topic and your stance. After that, we'll open up the floor. For those of you who have questions, since it's going to be a busy night, we will likely only be taking super chats. But if we do see some good questions in there, we will probably um, pull those up. So you can still uh, tag Politically Provoked and um, give us your questions. And if they're good enough, we'll, we'll get to that during the Q&A. Um, Sean Laz has a time frame, so we're going to work around that. Um, and it will probably be about like an hour and a half for the debate and an hour for questions. So why don't we get started with opening statements, Sean? Why don't you get us going? Okay, sure. Um, so the topic is pretty broad, uh, especially since uh, I don't think that the so-called Great Replacement is like a centrally planned conspiracy or something like that. So the way that I interpreted what we were talking about um, basically has to do with what are the problematic aspects of immigration or demographic change and how should we react to them? Um, obviously, demographic change changes a country in a bunch of ways. Some of those are going to be good. Some of them are going to be bad. Uh, and it's been especially true in the case of the U.S. And at this point in the United States, it's not practical to talk about whether or not a demographic shift, which turns the majority into a minority, is a net good or bad. Uh, you can talk about two different kind of replacements that have already happened or are definitely going to happen. The first being the original WASP stock of the country that became a minority before any of us were born. And white people today, the fact of the matter is that if you look at people under the age of 16 in the United States, they're already a minority, so there's no sort of immigration policy or something like that that can prevent this from happening. It's just a reality. And so because of that, the question of practical value is how we should react to the fact that white people are going to become a minority. Uh, to do this, I think we need to look at what the negative effects of demographic change have been so far in pretty concrete terms. But by looking at these negative effects, that's not to discount any positive effects that have happened. It's just that we don't need to address any positive effects because they're not problems. Um, so you, like I said before, I think, or maybe I didn't say this, you can look at immigration in the United States. Well, you could look at it through a lot of waves, but the two that I'm going to talk about mostly are uh, in the first place, a wave of Catholic and Jewish immigration that happened uh, the late 19th century, early 20th century, and then the more recent Hispanic wave of immigration. Uh, with regards to the first, um, the most profound effect has to do with politics, I would say, in, in that they managed to sort of move the American institutions to the left. Uh, this is first evident at the level of the American government, uh, these sort of immigrants voted in the Kennedy and Johnson administrations. Uh, even in 1964, which everyone remembers as a big blowout election, the fact of the matter is that the sort of traditional uh, population of America, uh, the Protestants, voted on net for Goldwater, uh, which is, I think, pretty crazy given the margins by which he lost. Um, 
And the the same wave of immigrants and their descendants cause American elites as a whole to net identify on the left rather than the right. And that's an important thing to uh, kind of soak in, I think. that I, What I mean by that is, is very literally that without these immigrants, American elites at this time period in the 60s, 70s, and 80s would have leaned to the right. It is They are the sufficient cause of uh, them leaning to the left, which is a, a very profound effect. Uh, there's research showing that judges from these sorts of lines tend to vote to the left relative to uh, Protestant ones. And even on this, uh, in the Supreme Court today, uh, the Supreme Court is almost, in, I mean, there's one person who's not a Catholic or a Jew, and they were raised Catholic. Uh, so the influence of these people, you could also look at uh, donors. The fact of the matter is the Jews and Catholics today still make up the vast majority of the top donors to democratic politics. Um, and, and, it, and so they've had quite a profound influence, not only in spreading the left, but also in changing the left. So 100 years ago, there was a sizable group of progressives who were elitist in their politics, whose programs centered around things like eugenics, as I think everyone knows. But in the 1960s, it was largely the descendants of uh, these sorts of immigrants working in American universities who began to win this sort of long fought battle to make biological explanations of group differences taboo. Uh, and they became large enough in influence such that egalitarian pronouncements, for instance, that there's no biological back into the idea of race. Things like this were added to textbooks, uh, despite the fact in this research showing this, that these arguments were only convincing to anthropologists who had uh, these sort of lineages. As so soon racism sort of took the place of biology as the explanation for group inequality and white people ended up being blamed for disparities in education, criminality, economic status, and so on. And unsurprisingly, in recent years, uh, research has shown that self-identified liberals now hold a significant racial bias against white people, and at the same time, feelings of guilt have taken a psychological toll. Hey, on Sean, one, one minute, okay. Sure, right, minute. Opportunities uh, of white people have been diminished through affirmative action. Um, and then on the other hand, you have had the sort of the Hispanic immigration more recently. Uh, it's been the means through which various Democratic uh, presidential bases have been won. Democrat uh, Hispanic immigration has decreased native wages, added to the federal debt, created a domestic Hispanic population with a crime rate significantly higher than the white people, and both recent immigration and birth rates have contributed to the rising ethnic diversity of the United States, which predicts a decrease in social cohesion and an increase in suicide. Given these set of problems in no particular order, I think we should do things like get the public to take seriously the idea that biology rather than racism is at the root of much of group inequality, uh, insist that white people instill in themselves a moderate but healthy sense of ethnic identity so that we combat rather than contribute to discrimination against ourselves, encourage the spread of things like embryo selection and later gene editing so that we can overcome problematic instances of genetic inequality. Uh, and I, I just admit it's all just stop there. I have a little more, but if I can end there. My turn? And yeah, I sped up kind of weirdly at the end because you said the, the time thing. That was how I was speaking. Um, yeah, that's as I guess you can go. Okay, gotcha. Um, so I, I agree the topic for this was pretty broad. Um, initially, I think it was sold as the Great Replacement, but I guess we're not necessarily going to be talking about any type of explicit Great Replacement. Um, I don't know exactly where this conversation is going to go, but I mean, in general, I obviously defend the free movement of people. I think that there's been obvious economic benefits to it. I think there's been obvious benefits to the people immigrating, and I think there's been an obvious benefit and detriment to some extent to natives as well, although I imagine we'll get into that, um, especially on the economic and crime front. Um, we can talk a lot about, I guess, immigration changing politics. I think that there is a lot of interesting conversation to be had there. I think that there is uh, kind of this weird opinion among some people on the very far right that you can kind of like freeze groups of people in time and never have their political opinions change over time, or that you can prevent groups of people from moving around, even though people move around the country all the time, even within the country. I don't know if you would want to restrict that as well. Um, yeah, I think uh, we can do yeah either the economics or the social justice side, or, or I'm sorry, the criminal justice side or the moving side. And yeah, I'm just hopping into the back and forth. Oh, I guess the final, as a final point to my statement, um, usually the, the, the punctuation to all of these statements as well, um, this is the same if I, bar, uh, if I debate far left people or far right people, is most people seem to either immediately concede or will wrestle a little bit and then concede that most of kind of like the prescriptions that come out of these very far, um, these very far viewpoints are basically completely impossible to enforce anyway, which makes it feel a, a little bit fringe and like, well, what's the point then of going down this road? Shouldn't there be like more moderate positions that we can argue for? Because right now this is totally untenable. But yeah, we'll see what's what's up. Okay, sure. So, um, so what exactly did you mean? You said there was an economic aspect you'd like to talk about, a criminal aspect, and then a moving aspect. And I wasn't totally clear on what you meant by the moving aspect. Um, you mentioned that uh, immigration tends to move institutions to the left. 
Oh, okay, sure. I guess let's start there then. Uh, yeah, so I think that the way that people vote in elections, I think is pretty complicated. Um, if any, if we've learned anything over the past five years, it's that the left-right dichotomy breaks down pretty hardcore around uh, different types of issues. Uh, the best example of this, I think, is like the culture wars, where people are having these like hard political views staked out, not because they fall neatly in some left to right paradigm, but because they have like one or two issues that are really important to them. I think that if conservatives highlighted enough of these like important issues to them, they would actually find that they have a lot of camaraderie, especially with minority groups, because minority groups tend to be more socially conservative than more of the white groups, especially um, especially when it comes to like the more progressive, like comparing it to the progressive aspect of like the Democratic Party. Uh, and I think we saw that a lot break out in the last election with like the ACAB rhetoric and the socialist rhetoric driving some minorities away from the Democratic Party. And that's why you saw such high turnouts in Hispanic voters for Trump. Uh, sure. And I don't think I disagreed with anything that you just said, at least as I heard it. Um, I mean, it, it is definitely true that uh, conservatives and liberals, and especially you know white people, minorities have a lot in common politically. Uh, I've, I've written before about the fact that I think this is especially true if you look at very concrete questions. Like if you ask, for instance, a question like, uh, "Do you think the big government is good or the free market?" You see huge ethnic differences with white people overwhelmingly saying free market, minorities saying big government. But if you ask a concrete question like, "Should we raise the income tax rate on people making more than two hundred thousand dollars a year or something like that?" Uh, there's a lot more convergence. Uh, it's certainly true that ethnic groups have changed how they vote over time. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's all true. Uh, do you, so I don't think I disagree. Well, I guess so. Like the one of the said, things did you disagree with something. Yeah, I guess one one of the things that I hear cited, and it sounded like you were getting into this, or maybe this might not actually be your position at all. But I oftentimes hear. Um, I, sorry, somebody's air conditioner just turned on, I think. Um, I oftentimes hear people on the right uh, will say things like, I'm very scared of losing elections because of all the, uh, I'm, not, I'm not trying to um, strum in your position, but like essentially like Hispanic people are coming in and they're gonna move like the whole country over to the left. And when conservatives say that, I think it's sad for them because I don't think that is the case necessarily. I think that a lot of Hispanic people have way more socially conservative values on average than white people. And then on the flip side of that, I get frustrated with the Democratic Party because the Democratic Party oftentimes look at Hispanic voters like, hey, you guys are voting D no matter what, fuck you. And I think that there were electoral consequences for that last election uh, in terms of like the large sway, how, how important Trump was on that ticket uh, to a lot of Hispanic voters. And I don't think anybody predicted how large they would swing for Trump compared to prior elections. Gotcha. Okay. So, so but I guess I would want to make a distinction here between the things that individuals believe and their political impact at an institutional level. Because, I mean, it is true, just matter of factly, that the effect of Hispanic immigration has been to move American electoral politics to the left. I mean, do you disagree with that? That that's just been what's happened in like the last 20 years? Um, as an aggregate, that's probably true. Yeah. Right. And I don't think there's great cause for Republicans to be optimistic about getting like the majority of Hispanic votes. Uh, you can look at presidents, Republican presidents who did abnormally well with Hispanic voters, uh, George Bush in 2004, uh, Trump to some extent. Um, but even when we talk about these cases of doing exceptionally well, we're still talking about instances of getting the minority of Hispanic votes. Now, of course, it is possible that in the future that's going to change, uh, but there's no obvious reason i don't think for optimism on the part of the republicans that they could actually get the majority of these votes anytime soon anyway do you disagree with that um i'm not sure that's a really hard one i think that the i think that that's probably safe to say going forward for the next one or two election cycles but um i think that if the democrats continue to continue to drop the ball when it comes to appealing to um hispanic voters and if republicans can like make more inroads in that direction um especially in places like florida I, I think that Republicans can turn like the Hispanic constituency into like a valid voter block that protects them, at least in certain states um, like Florida and Texas, as long as they can hold on to it enough. Uh, obviously, it, it would take some time because it was still like, uh, was it like a 30, 40 point difference, I think, between Hispanics, between Trump and, and Hillary, which is substantial. Um, but I, I think that there is like potential there for, for Republicans to make more inroads there. And also, they don't also have to completely flip even a majority of the Hispanic vote. They do it gradually over time, and then they can hold margins with other um, constituencies. It, it bodes well for them electorally. So at the moment, they don't have to win an electoral, uh, a majority of Hispanic votes in order to win elections. But mm -hmm. obviously, if we're talking about the, the net effect of Hispanics on the electoral outcomes, the party they majority vote for 
I mean, it's not necessarily because of how the American electoral system works, the electoral colleges votes and such, and it would depend on where exactly they're placed. But in general, it's going to favor the party that most of them vote for, obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not sure exactly how like in, important this is, but just some of the sort of specific examples you gave. With respect to Florida, um, I, I definitely would not be optimistic about Florida just because uh, the last Pew point I saw was showing that the sort of Cubans in Florida – who have been traditionally the Hispanics in Florida voting for Republicans. And it is a Hispanic group that historically has voted net Republican uh, in many elections. But the, the young Cubans in Florida are leaning way Democrat uh, these days, way more so than their parents did, including when their parents were kids. So I don't, well, by kids, I mean young adults, I guess. Um, I'm not as familiar with polling in Texas, but in Florida, mm-hmm. uh, do you think there's cause for some reason to think that the situation is better than what that makes it look like? I think it's hard to say because young people are, it's the past few cycles have shown us young people are very far left right now in the United States, but they also don't ever vote. Um, this is why Bernie Sanders has a rally with thousands of people and like still can't outperform in the polls um, or, or outperform at the actual ballot box or ballot box or the primary box, whatever you call it, when, when it came time to vote. Um, I think Florida had the closest margin. I want to say, um, I want to say it was like, it was less than 55%, I think, of the Hispanic votes that was won in Florida. And then followed by, I think it was like Texas and Nevada, where these weren't, it wasn't like these massive, like 50 point blowouts. Like it was like fairly close. And I think the support overall dropped in um, places like Florida and Georgia for, um, between the difference between Clinton and Biden when it came to Hispanics voting in, in those states. And I don't think people expected that because for better or for worse, you Democrats basically screamed for four years about how racist and horrible Trump was. So everybody kind of took it for granted that like obviously brown people aren't going to vote for Trump, but that didn't seem to be the case. Like the, the change percentage of support was pretty significant. Now, I don't know specifically if that was just because either less people voted or not. I don't think that could be the case because like it was a record turnout. So yeah, I, I'm, I'm not trying to say, let me be clear when I couch this argument. I'm not trying to say that like, oh my God, like tomorrow Republicans are nicer to Hispanic people. Boom, you've got the majority. I'm just saying that it feels like all too often Republicans will write off Hispanics as a lost voter block, or at least sometimes when I talk to them, they will. But like they've been doing consistently better, I think since Obama, which isn't too long, but they, they've been like pulling impressive Hispanic numbers. And I don't think that's totally a lost cause to move in that direction to appeal to some of those voters. Okay, gotcha. Um, so I think maybe we should take a, a, a step back uh, uh-huh. because, well, I'm just not sure how central th- this specific issue is because it sounds like we don't, I mean, I agree that the Hispanic vote could change in the future. I think that e- even if there was ever a situation where the Democrats were like winning every election, the way American electoral politics works is such that it would tend back towards an equilibrium of two parties. Either the Republican Party would change massively, a new party would come, and the chances of the ethnic breakdown being the exact same as it was before would be very low. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, I don't think we have – the disagreements we have here probably aren't worth making the debate about, uh, so to speak. Now, what, what I was talking about before, the political impact of immigration, um, and, and when, I, when I say that it moved the country to the left, just to reiterate something I said at the beginning of my opening – well, I guess what – Brittany asked me to introduce myself, that I have lots of political positions that are left-wing and some that are right-wing. So that's not like me saying the bad thing, basically. Uh, but that they've moved American electoral politics to the left, that they've captured various institutions, while at the same time, and I think very clearly contributing to the fact that the left has changed into uh, possessing some of the characteristics that I talked about before in terms of uh, the what we now call woke narratives, you know, about explaining group inequality with reference to racism, uh, banning biology as an explanation, supporting uh, what I would see as a kind of anti-white uh, bias. And I don't think a lot of people appreciate the extent to which earlier waves of immigration were instrumental in setting up that kind of ideology. But to me, that's the most, like when I say they move the country to the left, the main source of uh, the main thing that makes that problematic to me is this specific aspect of left-wing ideology uh, that they not only help spread in virtue of just spreading the left in general, but also helping creating that aspect of ideology. Um, okay, so I mean, there's going to be parts of this that I agree with pretty heavily, and there's going to be parts of this that I disagree with pretty heavily. So in terms of like picking out something, so I, um, I think that all of the anti-white stuff is very, very, very cringe. 
Uh, and I think it's probably pushed past cringe into being somewhat harmful, uh, at the very least on social media, if not informing like broader political narratives at this point. And I think in the last election cycle, again, I think we're starting to see that play out where like going on Twitter or going on media and, you know, saying like fuck white, uh, fuck white people, you know, the white genocide, the Mayo side, blah, 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 is like, it was funny memes five years ago, but people are taking it way too seriously now and that's starting to bleed over to other things. I agree that that is highly problematic and that needs to stop. It should have stopped already. Um, in terms of like other arguments, uh, I don't know how far we're gonna go down the biology road. I, I don't know if I agree that like we've banned biology. Um, if we're gonna get into like intelligence research and everything, like there are still a lot of people that do research here. It's obviously, it's a highly contentious subject for a number of reasons. Um, it's also a very complicated subject for a number of reasons. Um, I, I don't know if you're saying that like we need to be teaching about like racial differences in grade school or if you think that there is like a broader like banning of this type of research at the college level. Um, but yeah, those are two things that I hear, one that I agree with and one that I disagree with. Sure. So when I say banned, um, obviously what I mean is that there's been imposed a large social and sometimes economic cost on doing that kind of research. And that's true that there are people who do such, such research. Uh, most of those people tend to either be outside of formal academia to some extent or quite old, people who have tenure that are very difficult to fire. Um, you can look at examples uh, that are counter to this, um, but a lot of them are stories of people getting fired for doing this kind of research. Um, like, uh, was like there's two Weingart brothers who are both professors, and this happened to one of them, not the other. And I don't remember which it was, uh, but that's, that's an obvious example uh, of that sort of thing. Like Noah Carl. Of which? Uh, can uh, wait, name? can you give me what was the first name? Uh, ben Weingart or. It's, it's one of the Weingart brothers. They're both psychology, or they both were psychologies of professor, psychologies of professor, professors of psychology, one, one of which wrote a thing defending a sort of hereditarian view of race and IQ, got in trouble for it, ended up losing his position in academia. And that's, that's just an example. I mean, do, do you not think that there's a level of taboo about talking about this and that people are incentivized not to talk about it? Um, I think it probably depends on where you're at, um, like in terms of like mainstream media, probably. But in terms of like academia, I imagine it probably depends on what particular school you're going to or what particular like, you know, research institute you're part of. Um, I don't know, like I've heard, um, I remember there was the intellectual dark web of people that came out and it seemed like, um, I wish I could remember this lady's name. She was on a Sean Carroll podcast. I, if, I think academics will push boundaries and they'll research things that are, can be contentious or whatever. For instance, there's a lot of back and forth on people that write over World War II stuff. Um, but I, I don't think that that necessarily means it's like banned, but it's so hard to figure out when people say that what they mean. So for instance, like if I were to look up this, uh, the Weingard guy, am I gonna find that he was fired because he published a study that said like, oh, like, you know, we can see that there's a difference here, blah, blah, blah. Or am I gonna find that he was coming out and saying like, oh, black people are genetically IQ inferior to white people. And therefore like, that's how we need to move forward. Like, what, what am I gonna find if I were to look up? Like, do you remember the exact reason why he was fired or why his contract wasn't renewed? So. If if I'm remembering correctly, it was because he published an article um, or maybe gave a lecture, one of the two, but defending the idea that genes were a significant cause or at least potentially a significant cause and a cause worth researching of uh, racial differences in mean IQ. I mean, he's not like a, a Nazi or something like that. Mm -hmm. That's what you're sort of getting at. Uh, no, no, I'm not saying he's a Nazi. I'm just saying, like, did he come out and make, like, really strong statements? Because oftentimes I'll hear, like, oh, like, this person was fired uh, just because they had a different opinion, but then their posted opinion is actually, like, like pretty inflammatory. And it's like, okay, well, if you're working at a college, you're posting really inflammatory shit. Like, that's not, not just your research, but it's, like, your opinion on top of it that's not that surprising. Um, yeah. Oh. Hello? Hello? Oh, sorry, I heard the horn. <laughs> oh, oh, yes, yeah, so there's a phone in the background. Okay. Sorry, go ahead. Um, oh, no, I, I was just saying, like, if I, I think that if people are being fired just for having, like, opinions on uh, research or whatever, or for publishing or studying certain things, I think that's obviously bad. Um, but if you've got, like, professors or, like, representatives of academic institutions coming out and, you know, publishing op eds or writing opinion pieces on it that have, like, way stronger opinions, I mean, I. I I don't think that's as bad if you end up like having a contract not getting re for, renewed for that. That's not um, that's not like that controversial. I don't think, but yeah. 
Well, I guess it depends on what you mean by a strong opinion. Obviously, academics regularly write pieces giving strong opinions the vast majority of the time. They're not punished for that. Um, but also, so so what I mean, I guess there are two things I want to say. Like, Firstly, mm -hmm. uh, there, there's pressure that comes from academia uh, in these instances, like we're talking about now. There's also pressure that comes from external forces. Um, a lot of IQ researchers that have talked a lot about race, uh, even decades ago, were harassed in fairly severe ways, uh, got things thrown at them. One of them famously was assaulted in the 70s and stuff like this, just while giving lectures and stuff like that. And even if it was true that academia was a reasonably tolerant place of this sort of research, and I, I don't think it is, but I don't think that's easy to show because we'd have to like go into detail through a bunch of case studies. It's not like there are statistics on that. Yeah, sure. Show us whether or not that's true. But even if that was true, the fact that that's obviously not making its way into the public discourse, despite the fact that it's not as if the public is not concerned with the causes of group inequality. Mm -hmm. It's the horn again. Um, but setting the horn aside, it's not as if people are not interested in the causes of group inequality. Uh, it's that this cause of them is almost entirely undiscussed. Um, yeah, that might be the case. I mean, if if it is the if it is the fact that, and it, I I would probably agree outright. I think it'd be silly not to. There's pro there is probably always like pushing in certain directions, uh, especially in academia for a variety of reasons to like move people into certain conversations. Um, it wouldn't surprise me if these were topics that were relatively contentious. Um, that like if you gave an opinion that seemed to contradict like what is the main left-leaning uh, kind of viewpoint, uh, depending on the university you're in, you might find yourself in some hot water. Um, if that is happening, that's bad. Um, I'm just not aware of like there are researchers that really want to research this particular thing, but they're not able to because of the university. That like they can't even do the they can't even do the research. They can't get the funding for the study. They can't get the the people together to do it. Um, if that's happening, I, I would say that that's obviously even more bad than somebody getting fired because they made some dumb tweets or something. But yeah. You know. Sure. So, so I feel like we're kind of. I, don't, I feel like this is a little weird. Uh, what's what's happening right now? Just in the sense that we're we're talking about this in a fairly removed way. But I'm, I mean, I'm like positive that there just are things that, in terms of group inequality, that you think are due to racism, that I don't, um, and things that I think are due to biology that you don't. It feels a little weird to talk sort of around that instead of just maybe going into some of those things. Um, I mean, I, I guess we can, um, I, if, I don't know if this entire great replacement is just going to turn into like a, like racial IQ difference debate, but I mean, um, I, the, the biggest what, problem what? that I usually have with these, with, with this line of argumentation is there's two things is that one, oftentimes it wouldn't dramatically change the prescription unless you're very far, I don't want to say to the right, but very into like the, there's a large amount of IQ that is like genetically determined. Um, and then two even if there were prescriptions, they are wholly and completely politically uh, unfeasible. So it's like they're basically relegated to like 4chan threads or like off websites talking about them because none of these are ever being implemented in real life. So like for, for so for the second one, like obviously you like um, and I'm not saying you're doing this. I want to be very clear. I, I actually don't know your position. That's right. I, if you're if your prescription is like we need to deport or we need to curb immigration from like different you know racial groups of people there's a whole host of reasons why this politically will never happen number one or that was the second point and then back to the first point um if there are problems even if there were problems related to like iq due to like racial differences there's still like obviously a whole host of environmental factors that we can still continue to fix in the united states to increase the standard of living for everybody so just because there may be some difference genetically between groups of people doesn't mean that we would stop making those pushes for improvement uh sure obviously i don't think that we should uh, avoid improving environments just because genes matter that would be kind of weird to think uh as for the sort of political things that follow from it well i would say the first thing that follows from it uh, politically for me anyway is just wanting to get people to understand that biology is a significant cause of these group differences specifically because it replaces racism as an explanation uh, and therefore i think if done in the right way would lessen the sort of bias uh, that we see at various levels against white people. Um, 
And, what and is like other, the? Can you explain expand on that? What is like the bias we see against white people? Is there anything you can think of besides like affirmative action, which is already like a pretty minor thing? Sure. So I mean, there there are broadly I divide this into two categories. There are socioeconomic things and there are psychological things. So in terms of socioeconomic things, I mean, I guess you could just call any instance of socioeconomic bias in favor of minorities affirmative action. I'm not sure what you mean by affirmative action being a, a minor thing. Sometimes when people talk about affirmative action, what they mean is the literal, official, formal, like the quota system of federal contract work or something like that, uh, which obviously does not take up a majority of the economy. But if you look at questions like um, questions about what kind of affirmative action policies companies are instituting and whether or not they are trying to meet certain targets for increasing minority employment and things like this. That's true of just the majority of very large companies in the United States. And bias at this level, at the level of college admissions and things like this, bias at the level of hiring, which is somewhat complicated to tease out. Uh, but all these things contribute to the sort of economic and education opportunities of white people being diminished relative to non-white people. And then at the psychological front, uh, we talked before, some it seems like you agreed that the left today exhibits a kind of anti-white bias. And it's also, this is an empirically tested thing, it's not just a thing I'm saying, that uh, thinking that, you know, having this, this sense of white guilt and thinking that uh, your group is a sort of, been this oppressive thing that has damaged other groups, unsurprisingly that is not very healthy psychologically significantly increases the risk for uh, various kinds of depression sort of things and so and at the same time white people unlike other groups in america like white people overwhelmingly don't think of themselves as having any kind of ethnic identity and this is somewhat psychologically damaging as well because ethnic identity in a moderate and healthy level and i want to be clear when i talk about a healthy and moderate ethnic identity because a lot of times when people that are white talk about increasing ethnic identity. Uh, there's a sense of like, oh, so, so like the Nazis. I know what I mean is the sort of ethnic identity at the level that other ethnic groups in the United States currently have, uh, which allows you to at once have a kind of a, a degree of uh, respect and pride for your ancestry in a way that is psychologically beneficial without leading you to be literally a racial nationalist. And so that's the kind of, hopefully that helps people, you know, concretely see what I mean by a moderate or healthy level of ethnic identity mm -hmm. uh, and the white people's lack of that has also been psychologically damaging so those are two major sure. branches we could talk about I guess so hitting on the second one um okay so there's like a couple trap questions I would ask but I'm just going to talk for a, a little bit and then you can tell me wh where you fall on that so I'm curious so uh so the first question I would say is like well do white people have an ethnic identity so I think that there's like two big problems I think one is I don't think that there is a white ethnic identity in the United States, because if you're like a white ethnic person in the US, you're like your ethnic identity is just kind of American. Um, I don't think that um, I can't generalize to like Africa or South America or yeah, so maybe in those two kinds of different, but in the time that I've spent in Europe, I've never heard Europeans refer to like a white ethnic identity. Like I know that like Swedes and Norwegians give each other a lot of shit. I know that you've got Russians and Germans. Um, you've got British people, Anglo-Saxon. Like there are people that have very strong opinions about or can have strong opinions about their like ethnic backgrounds in across different European countries. But I've never heard the term, and this is totally anecdotal, so I could be off, but I've never in, in Europe heard people talk as much about white people as I do like in, for some people in the United States. Because in Europe, the, there is no such thing as like white ethnic lines. Like there are white people that hate other white people. That's like a very Americanized term. So I, I guess, um, and then when you talk about later on about how there's like these group ethnic identities. So I think that, I don't know how, where you draw these lines out, but I would say something that's been very frustrating to me in the Democratic Party is and I, I'm, I'm not accusing you, but it sounds like you're, you're making the same, what I would say, like a, an error in thought, is that we have very clear, like, white people, Asian people, black people, Hispanic people. And Democrats fuck up all too often labeling all Hispanics as the same. And oh my God, there is such a difference between, like, people that come from just Mexico or people that are coming from countries in South America, especially places like Venezuela or Bolivia, or as you know, and I know I'm half Cuban, uh, the Cubans that live in Hialeah that come from like Cuba um, are very, all these groups, all these Hispanic groups are very distinct. And then moving over to like African groups or black people, um, you know, Africans that come over like Nigerians or people from Kenya, these people tend to be like very educated, very wealthy, and they're far different than like the descendant of a slave. Um, so, so circling all the back, I 
just, I talked a bunch because I'm not trying to trap you with questions. So my question is like, how can white people in America have like a white ethnic identity without like further delineating that among like, oh, well, I'm like 20% Irish, 50% like, how does that work? Where do you construct that identity from? So I think that, I mean, there are two things to say, I guess. In the first place, and I think this would actually be somewhat more difficult for reasons I'll go into, but it, but it's possible that a more kind of European nationalist identity springed up in the United States among white people could play a similar role. Although, yeah, for isn't it kind of weird? That, but 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 I wanted to respond to what yeah you yeah go for it. yeah go go. Um, that it's definitely true that people in Europe do not think about uh, white people in as monolithic a way as we do here. Uh, it's fairly obvious reasons for that it's it's that in europe different sort of white people are all segregated by geography and have been for a very long time and in america that's not nearly the case to the same degree sort of um i guess i i would want to know what you think the foundation of an ethnic identity needs to be because to me i mean and this might sound a little weird because on the one hand and this isn't that weird any kind of socially constructed group you pick uh chances are even if you pick them randomly and ethnic groups are not chosen randomly, of course, but even if you pick them randomly, there's a high chance that if you look in their genome, there's going to be some way to genetically predict membership of that group. Uh, and with ethnic and, and racial identities, uh, this is very true because they're linked in an imperfect way to continental ancestry and the like, um, or national ancestry. But even though I think that, it is also obviously true that the boundaries of these groups are socially constructed, uh, that they change over time. And that the reason that in America it would make sense, I think, for white people to form a kind of white identity to a degree is because of the fact, uh, I mean, the same reason in some ways that black people in America have a black identity rather than a you know, more nationalist identity or I think tribal identity, even in the case of uh, what might have happened at that time in the African context, is because... Well, for one thing, it's just politically relevant, right? The the left is not mad at German Americans. The left does not have a bias against Irish Americans. The left has a bias against white Americans. If I'm right in saying that this is impacting white people's well-being, well, then that is the group membership on the basis of which uh, they are being impacted. And I think that actually historically is sort of the, if anything, the gold ticket for the foundation of a kind of ethnic identity. I mean, what would you think about that? In terms of, does it have an impact politically? <clears throat> In terms of, of whether or not white people, as white people being so politically salient, uh, gives the beginning of a, that that is a kind of rationale for an ethnic identity along those lines. I just, the problem is that, um, so I, I guess like, so something I was gonna pause in the beginning, like when you said that like, maybe white people in the US should have like a European nationalist identity, that it just, it seems so strange to me because I feel like, I feel like a European would make fun of me if I were to go to any country in Europe and say like, oh yeah, we've got an ethnic group of European nationalists and like Europeans are like, well, we don't have that. What does it even mean? What do you mean? You're American. Like that, that idea of like white people trying to bind together on the fact that a lot of them came from Europe is just, let, let me answer a second part and then I, I, I can maybe explain why this is more confusing to me. So when you ask, I think you asked the question of like, what is an ethnic identity? Um, to, to me, I feel like an ethnic identity, I mean, if we're being totally honest, there's going to be some amount of like physical characteristics. Like, what do you look like? Like, it's going to be weird to have an ethnic identity of being African-American or Asian, uh, if you look like me, obviously. Um, but I think that a huge amount of your, of what we call ethnic identity ends up being cultural traditions that are kind of like handed down and passed on from generation to generation. So we can think of a lot of things that are related to people's ethnic identities that really have nothing to do with like being human in general or, or being a certain type of human. For instance, like there can be certain like uh, festivals or there could be certain parties or dances. There could be certain types of foods. Uh, these are, there can be, uh, you know, certain types of celebrations, you know, quinceañeras. Um, you, you can have like all of these things that are traditions that are kind of passed down and those kind of become baked into people's cultural identity but um, or, or, or ethnic identity. But I think a lot of that ends up being kind of cultural as well. So then if I have that understanding of what an ethnic identity is, that there's like a lot of tradition and culture baked into it, and then I go back to like white Americans in the United States, I could probably draw, I guess, like ethnic lines, but it would be more cultural lines. Like 
if you've ever met people in like from fucking New York or Boston, like these people are just, they're totally different humans than the people that live over here in like LA or San Diego or up in like San Francisco, like West Coast versus East Coast would be like one way you could draw a, a boundary. But then even when you go like East Coast, right? If you're in like North Carolina North, those are a particular type of people. They're not the same as people in Florida. These are a to also a totally different breed of people. Um, so I, I don't know, like trying to group up all white people like that into one group, it sounds about as damaging as when Democrats try to group all Hispanic people into one group. And then you get like some dipshit, you know, 19 year old college white kid trying to tell somebody that just fled Venezuela that socialism is awesome because all brown people must think this particular thing. I think I think that's I feel like that's an error in grouping. I don't think you can draw it so cleanly. That's how I would view it. Sure. So I, I think you said a few things. So I'm going to say a, a few things. Um, firstly, so it's true that uh, ethnic identities are normally associated with uh, religion, food, music, et cetera, these sort of behaviors. And, and in fact, I mean, this sort of consumer research has been done showing this, and it's not surprising that if you analyze someone's consumer behavior in the United States and the like, and their religious things, all these things are predictive of race in the United States. Just yeah, they're all probably proxies to some extent. Yeah, that wouldn't surprise me. But, but it's a very, um, so th th there are two things that have to happen. Like one, there has to be a practical group difference in behavior. And two, uh, there has to be an identification with that behavior. And there are group differences in behavior in the United States, for sure, between white people and non-white people uh, on average. Uh, but white people don't sort of psychologically think of those things in the way that leads to group identity, uh, for the most part, at least currently. Now, it's also true that uh, there's definitely variation, you know, within, within all groups, within, including white people in the United States. Um, the thing, I, I, two things, I mean, one, that's, I think that's true of lots of different, I mean, you could say the same thing about like, there's significant differences between groups in Germany and yet German identity was a thing. Uh, but also, well, and we could ask, why is that? Because there does need to be some kind of common denominator probably. Uh, but, and often, I, I, I just think this is true historically that oftentimes that common denominator is some kind of narrative about a shared interest due to uh being unfairly treated by another group um and that is something that i think white americans broadly have in common i mean whether you're a white person in new york or texas or california or wyoming uh you're going to face a degree of institutional bias against you on account of the fact that you're white I mean, again, aside from like affirmative action in college, which I think is like a way more specific conversation we can have if you want, I don't know how much institutional bias exists against white people as a whole in the United States right now. Or, or can you expand on so, that, I guess, when you say that? What do you mean by that? Aside from obviously like the anti-white bullshit you see like on Twitter or sometimes in the media or whatever, which is a little cringe. I wish I agree. Sure. So, so talking about the socioeconomic stuff, um, one of the things definitely is university admissions and that process. Uh, another thing has to do with, I, I think I talked about this before, that corporations now regularly have voluntary quotas they try to fill for minority hiring and this sort of thing. Um, I thought, weren't hiring has, quotas, is, hasn't it been ruled illegal in the United States? Are you not allowed to do that? Well, I, I think it depends on exactly how you construct them. Um, and definitely at the university level, it is illegal. Uh, it was made illegal like the 2000 four or six, something mm -hmm. like this. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, we can get into the way that the universities get around that if, if, if you want, although I don't know if that's particularly important, but in, in the private sphere, um, I mean, there are civil, the civil rights legislation that modifies how you do this, but lots of corporations openly say that they have goals of, you know, increasing minority employment and the like, and they go out of their way to try to hire minorities. And if someone goes out of their way to try to hire someone that isn't like you, Obviously, that's also them going out of their way to try to not hire someone who is like you. I guess it depends on like, so for instance, let's say that you've got like 10 people that apply for a job and like two are black and eight are white and you do everything you can to like push the black people through. I would say that like, that's probably not a good thing, that, that type of quota. But let's say that you want to increase the diversity of your particular corporation. And let's say that you send like recruiters to go and advertise at like a predominantly black or Asian or Hispanic high school or college. I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing to do. So I guess I just, I would have to know more particulars about like what is the type of program because there are ways in which like hiring quotas by race or pushing for diversity, I think could be done in a pretty toxic or cancerous way. And then I think there are ways you can do it where that's not really that bad of an idea. Corporations can decide where they want to invest their time recruiting people as long as they're not engaging in things that would violate, um, you know, like uh, racial quotas, like the Civil Rights Act or whatever, as long as they're not violating those laws and they're doing it in, in you know, like a recruitment kind of way, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. 
So the only instance in which I would think it would be a good thing to do would be if you had some uh, serious reason to think that specifically increasing the ethnic diversity of your team was you know practically important for the job or something like that. And in most cases, I don't think there is a good reason uh, to think that. We, we also at the, at the level of, of hiring, there's this issue um, because of the way that hiring works in the United States and in the world in general, you look at these sort of on paper resume qualifications. Uh, they do not predict the same level of skill across racial groups. And because of this, what you end up happening because the standards, I knew would be complicated to do otherwise in some ways of just allowing people to blatantly discriminate on the basis of race to a fairly profound degree. But what ends up happening is that black people are hired for positions that are much less actually qualified for the position than white people, uh, despite sometimes an equivalence on paper and that sort of thing. Or even the white I mean, like, black person having the superior qualification on paper. If that happens, uh, if it is the case that white people are being discriminated against on, on the basis of race, I believe that you have um, I don't even think an individual has to bring a, a suit against somebody. Uh, I think even the, uh, um, oh, fuck, I forget which department is of the, of the executive, uh, but I'm pretty sure the government can actually bring a case against your company if you're, if you're engaging in those hiring practices. And definitely another person can as well. If people claim that they've been racially discriminated against, it's up to the, I think the, the company has to put forth an affirmative, like, well, no, we're not doing it, and this is our proof how. It's one of those, like, you're almost like guilty until assumed innocent kind of things, uh, assuming you, 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 there's reason to believe that that discrimination is taking place. My, that, that's, my, my understanding is that you can't do those types of, like, racial hirings. Now, I'll being honest, I'm sure there are some hirers or recruiters or whatever that probably do engage in bad behavior, probably pro-white and anti-white. It just depends on where you're at in the country, of course, on an individual level. But in terms of like as a matter of corporate policy, my understanding is that that's still illegal in the United States. And if you're caught doing it, like the DOJ is going to come down on you for it. So there, there are two things. Um, in, the, in the first place, so it would be illegal for me if I'm a company to say, oh, I'm hiring this person. And the reason why I'm hiring them is because they're black and I want to hire black people and I don't want to hire non-black people, fuck whitey, mm -hmm. right? But if on the other hand, I said, I'm hiring this black person because I want to increase diversity and I think that diversity is a valuable reason, a valuable thing for my company for X, Y, and Z reason, I mean, that is something that, like said, literally just the majority of major corporations in the United States engage in that kind of thing, uh, which amounts to the same thing. And, and then the second thing I was talking about, this has to do with just the uh, just the intelligence limits of institutions that this kind of, of bias is is not going to be reliably detected because because the problem has to, it, it comes down like this that um, so say we're talking about a degree a degree for some given position and the, and those are the sort of qualifications you have to base hiring decisions on mm -hmm. to get that qualification you need a certain degree of skill now. If you have two groups who, in the first place, for a bunch of job relevant traits, uh, differ in their means such that one is to the right of the other, and then you have a qualification that requires them to have, you know, let's say one standard deviation above the average in skill, uh, even though on paper, if all you're looking at is that qualification, the group whose mean was to the right to the first place is still going to be to the right among those to the right of that qualification. Uh, that would be easy to show off a chart that might sound a little that'd be much easier to show with a picture. Um, but the, the the consequence of that is, is just that if you look at a white person and a black person, they both have the same degree from the same school, et cetera, uh, that on average, the job, the expected job performance of the white person is going to be significantly higher than that of the black person. But because, in fact, if you acted on that, that would be illegal in the United States. Uh, th that kind of bias is sort of inevitably going to happen given how our laws are currently constructed. So I, I don't know how much the broad generalizations matter when it comes to the hiring process, because typically in the hiring process, it's one of the few times in life where you're taking a look at like a particular applicant um, rather than like, oh, well, I'm, I have a black candidate and a white candidate. Let's see where they fall on, you know, is this guy one or two standard deviations and work performance? Rate? Like, I think you're looking at like the individual um, you're looking at like the individual uh, resumes between these two people. Um, I, I, I mean ultimately hiring decisions i guess it's going to depend on the type of workplace um if you believe that there is like a tangible benefit to having a certain hiring practice in the workplace um i, I mean if it put, like 
I'm trying to think like if you work for like a media company or something and you're trying to serve content to a large variety of people it probably makes sense that having some type of representation in your workplace is going to like tangibly increase the value of your company so i could see you pushing for it there um but if you work for just like a um I don't know, like a bottling plant or something and you just like bottle Pepsi and you're trying to only hire black people or something there, I imagine that would be bad. Uh, again, it would have to be, I would have to see like the specific hiring practice that we're talking about because I can imagine ways that it can be like pretty okay and I can imagine ways that it can be like, eh, this is probably not okay. Um, on a broad level, I don't know if you've heard of, um, I think it was a McKinsey study. Um, because I, I used to, because people will say things like diversity is our strength or whatever. And I think generally that's kind of a cringe thing to say. But I want to say people took a look at, I don't know if it was the top Fortune 500 companies in the United States. And it, it was like the, like pushing for like more diverse workplaces ended up having like an overall increase in the productivity of the company. Uh, I can dig for that for a second if you want me to find it. I don't, or I don't know if you're familiar with that piece of research. So like insofar as people push for it because they think it increases the value of the company, I mean, you probably should do that. But well, I'm, I don't know that specific uh, paper you're talking about, but I will say that there have been meta-analyses of the effect of, of team diversity on uh, productivity in, in business context, and that those meta-analyses have given no results. So that I would be inclined to think that on, on net, there's not typically a benefit. And uh, there's some research that, that indicates that that's because there's sort of damage to group cohesion that, that occurs that offsets the potential benefit in terms of uh, diverse perspectives and this sort of thing that on net it ends up normally being a wash um, but but setting aside the explanation just mm -hmm. analytically i think the effect there is normally null um and, and to get back to before what i was saying about job performance i mean even if you look at people working the same job in the same place and, and you give them standard measures of job performance that black people on average score significantly lower on job performance than do white people. And what this means almost necessarily is that the actual practical standard for job performance being applied to white people is higher than that of black people. Uh, there's a there's a complicated way you could say that it doesn't necessarily imply that, but it'd be very uh, unlikely and fishy to suggest. Uh, so I, I do I do think that just in workplaces in general, this is having a, a significant effect. I mean, I think like... Um... So it's it's hard to speak on averages because what we're talking about would have to involve, and this sounds kind of dumb to say because I'm not like I'm not telling you you have to tell me one specific black person and white person to give me an example of this because I don't expect you to be able to. Nobody would. Um, my my understanding is that if you are in a work environment and you feel like, given all else equal, two people are performing the same jobs. Um, and you're being not compensated fairly for it, and you want to make the accusation that it's due to like a protected class, like race or gender or something, you ought to be able to submit a complaint, I think, to the DOJ, and they will look at that. And the company has to be able to provide an affirmative where it's like, whoa, 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 hold on. Um, uh, you know, this is actually, it's not because of this, it's because of this reason. Like, it's on them to justify that. I know that you caught some of the debate that I had with um, Lauren Southern and the other Sean guy. And Sean brought up that Wells Fargo case. And I did reading afterwards because I hadn't heard of, there's a term for this. I don't remember the, the standing or whatever, but it's basically the idea that um, there are certain uh, statutes, I think, that come out of the... Um, Coming to the Civil Rights Act that show that like if you can demonstrate a difference between the way two people are compensated and you claim that it's because of race or gender, that the DOJ can come in and the company has to be able to provide a reason why there is a difference in compensation. Uh, so I guess my, my broad challenge is that like if this was something that was happening on a broader level, like why are nobody bringing you know cases against these companies? Why is nobody filing complaints to the DOJ? Like where, why isn't that happening? Because if I was working at a place and a black guy was earning the same as me and I was outperforming him, you know, two to one or one point five to one or whatever, I'd be like, wait, what the fuck? I I should be getting paid more. This is bullshit. Sure. So, so we can speculate about why that isn't happening. We could say things like mm -hmm. people might not, white people might not be thinking in those terms. Even if they do, they might not think that their complaint would go anywhere. Um, I think they would largely be correct in that because I do not think you could successfully sue a company in the United States on the basis of saying, Hey, uh, this guy so was, was, was promoted above me uh, just because he had this uh, qualification or whatever, but but on average, the white expected job performance is higher than the black performance, even when the black person has this qualification, the white person doesn't or something like that. Uh, because that kind of reasoning is, well, I mean, that's just seen as racist in the United States to even engage in that kind of thing. And again, we can speculate about why it's not happening, but if it is true that if you look at people working the same jobs, 
there is this job performance gap, uh, then I don't see how we could say that it's not happening. We could just I guess um, it's not being reported. What, so when we say like job performance gap, I guess like how how are we measuring that? Or what can you talk just like a little bit broadly about that? What do you mean by that? Sure. So broadly in the job performance literature, there are two branches of measurement. There's a so-called subjective and objective measurements. Uh, subjective measurement is you get like a supervisor or manager to rate on various scales, uh, how well they're doing the different aspects of the job. And, and then an objective measure, and you can only do this for certain jobs, but it's, you know, some, I, the idealized form is just how many widgets are you matter of fact producing per mm -hmm. shift or whatever. And we're looking at those sorts of measures of job performance, um, in, in general, there's a large racial gap, and that's not surprising for a bunch of reasons. You would think that, you know, just looking at all the people in all the workplaces in the United States, because the differences in, in education and blah, 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 there's not surprising there's a difference. But there's also a difference looking at people working the same jobs in the same companies, and that implies a difference in the hiring standard with respect to the actual predicted degree of job performance by race. I mean, I, if it was the case that this was happening in like in the same shops, so obviously we wouldn't expect the same performance of somebody working in a Walgreens, maybe from like city to city. Um, and I would, I would, I would assume that any type of research you're talking about would almost for certain take that into account because it would be silly not to. So I'm going to assume that they would. Um, but I mean, if it was the case that people were working like the same jobs in the same areas and getting different compensation or the same compensation for vastly different objective and subjective results, um, I, 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 I would. I would one. I w I don't know why nobody would be like pushing anything to the G DOJ about this because I'm pretty sure they would look into this, um, especially under like somebody like Trump, right? Well, I, I don't know why you wouldn't feel confident in bringing that type of suit forward. Well, and because the, it would play really well into the media. Um, and then two, I don't know why like exclusively, if this was the case, um, why companies wouldn't just exclusively start hiring white workers. I, if they're so much more productive than black workers in general, like why not just say like, okay, well, we're not gonna hire any black people ever. We're just gonna say we're hiring the white guy because he's more qualified. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, I think companies would, well, two reasons. One, business owners are not, uh, like, typically people that, that, A, know this, or even would be open to knowing this because this would be kind of a very far right extremist belief to have. Um, and, and in the second place, I, I just don't, I mean, the idea that you could legally do that in the United States, even if it were true, seems extremely uh, far-fetched to me. But but so I, I, maybe we can, we can move on, though, because it sounds like we're getting to an immovable place on this, that I think this discrimination is happening in a fairly widespread way because I think that my reading of the evidence suggests that it is, but you think, it, you can tell me if I'm wrong, but you think that uh, the fact that there's not more institutional sort of response or backlash against that kind of thing happening suggests very strongly to you that it's actually not happening because if it were, then there surely would be. Or at, at the very least that it might be a little bit more complicated than just like white workers in the same field are just de facto outperforming black workers uh, in the same field at the same jobs. It's because it, um, that it seems to be it's a country of over 350 million people at this point, I think um, it, it seems to be the case that at least somewhere like there would be uh, cases popping up where, you know, white worker is suing, you know, black place for uh, or, or is suing for racial discrimination because of wages between like e even if we go to the most extreme and I'm not saying that all Republicans like this are conservatives, but like at some point, some Republican or some conservative somewhere in the United States would have like filed these complaints if for no other reason, because it would play well on like Fox News or, you know, Tucker Carlson or Sean Hannity. Somebody would love to talk about a story like this. So it just it seems weird that if this is like a widespread thing happening, that it's that the explanation is that simple. Because I, I would I would expect to see that bleed out in some of the cases, and it might be the case that there ha maybe these suits have been filed, or maybe people have tried to and they've died, um, or there there is also I mean your other suggestion could possibly be the case as well that maybe people don't know that they can sue for things like this. Um, there are people that break uh, like pretty core tenets of you know federal precedent a lot. For instance, if you put like a uh, an add up on. Craigslist and you say, hey, I'm looking for a roommate, prefer to have like a woman that's around my age. Like that's technically illegal. You can't do that. You can't prefer roommates based on gender or age. Uh, that, that could be the case too. Um, I guess it's just something I would have to, I guess like dig more into, but. Sure, so I, I yeah, I don't, I don't think that we're gonna, I, I doubt that further going down this line is going to be very uh, mm -hmm. productive. If you want also, you can uh, shoot a thing into the chat and I'll look at it after too, I'm just curious, yeah. Oh, yeah, sure, I can do that. Um, 
so I, maybe we could talk. Do you want to talk about like the education thing? Uh, that's a and I don't know. I, there's a lot of possible things we could talk about, but the debate time is, is only uh, so long. Mm-hmm. So it seems like we're only going to get to talk about a fairly restricted subset of them. Um, hey, Sean, have you heard uh, the uh, little Timmy question? Uh, yeah, I've, I've, I've heard of the little Timmy question. <laughs> what What are your thoughts on that? Well, and I, I think I've said this before that it's just true that if, if what we're saying is, oh, well, when white kids become a, a minority and they're going to increasingly ethnically diverse schools, they're going to get bullied more, uh, something like this. I mean, that's just that that is empirically undeniably true that on average, uh, minority students bully people at a rate that is significantly higher and that uh, black on white bullying is much more common than white on black bullying and this sort of thing in schools uh, that uh, minority students tend to be a lot more problematic and in, in just about every way in the, the percentage of a school that is minority increases the risk for all kinds of behavioral and emotional problems and things like this. Um, at, at the same time, I don't want to be like hyperbolic about this. So for instance, there's a true statistic that a study found that a 1% increase in uh, the ethnic diversity of a school predicts about a 1% increase in the rate of suicide among students in that school. And that sounds like a very scary thing, uh, but you have to remember that the rate of suicide among students in schools to begin with is extremely low. And so a 1% increase in that, that doesn't mean that, that you know, little Timmy is gonna have a one in 10 chance of, of, of offing himself or something like that. Um, so I would characterize my position on the little Timmy question as, uh, I guess, a, a moderate one that, yeah, like that's going to is this, just Just curious, so is this like the rate of suicide in a school increases for 1% for every 1% increase in ethnic like integration or? I believe it's measuring ethnic, uh, like the, the percentage of the school that is non-white. I believe it could also be using an ethnic fractionalization. Yeah, the, okay, so the only reason yeah. what that, that sounds like it would be a really interesting like methodology to do. The only, the only interest, the, mo- the craziest thing about that is that I, I offhand don't believe that can possibly be true because the lo- the amount of granularity you're talking there with suicide being such a rare event, I can't believe you would actually be able to measure that. Even if what you're saying like was a descriptive, factually true thing of the universe, like because I'm trying to think like in my high school, again, this is super biased, uh, maybe in four years, maybe one kid committed suicide and like, we had like a class size of like, it must've been like three or 400. So like, like to be able to measure, I feel like you would have to have so many kids suiciding themselves in high school, in the same high school year after year after year to get like a 1% uptick increase. That seems like it would be so hard to have like that study that, or that, that measurement. It seems like it would be impossible to do. I'd be like really curious. I, maybe there's like another way they do that. Maybe through like like long, long, long periods of time or something. But I would be really curious to see how that, how that actually like is, is calculated. Sure. So I mean, I, I think it's calculated in basically the, the way you're saying. I mean, I can give you the uh, th- this is taken from a dissertation. And I mean, the so I'm just quoting directly from it here. These are not my words mm-hmm. uh, that quote, regardless of race, attending a high minority school increases risk of suicide significantly for every one percentage point increase in the percent minority in the school. The likelihood of suicide increases by one percent, uh, which, which I think is is almost verbatim what I said before looking at it. So I think I, I did not. Okay. So is the, yeah, gotcha. I'm not accusing you of just that, that granularity seems really hard to get. So is that, that's not necessarily talking about one school becoming more ethnically diverse. Is that just measuring suicidality across a wide set of schools? And then the more ethnically diverse ones tend to have more suicidal people. Is that, am I understanding that correctly? Yes. Yeah, so that the design of this is, is in other words, cross-sectional and not longitudinal. Oh, okay. Okay. That makes more sense now. Okay. Um, that's interesting, but also not too surprising. Um, I'm sure, because I know you write a lot about this, um, I'm trying to assume the benefit of the doubt here, because I don't think you would cite something that dumb, but I would hope that a study like that would obviously include uh, like lots of socioeconomic controls, because obviously like if you've got a pure, shining white school, it's probably a more wealthy school, therefore there's probably gonna be less problems with suicidality or mental illness or whatever. That would be like my guess, but, but I would hope that any study that's trying to analyze that is gonna be looking uh, like at SES conditions across the board for that kind of stuff. I would hope or assume so. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's been a while since I've uh, read this dissertation, but I know that they there's like a, mm-hmm. if you look at the regression charts, there's a very large number of independent variables touching on a whole bunch of different uh, socioeconomic and family-related things and mm-hmm. et cetera. Uh, so it's not, 
as dumb as it could be. Although obviously sure. it's not an experiment, yeah. so it's inherently. And it's like there's a really difficult question. Again, not to uh, accuse of bias, like that would be a really difficult question to actually have the um, uh, to, to to have an answer to, um, just because collecting the data on that. And then obviously with any study, if you strip away all every single variable, you have nothing left to look at anyway. So it would be difficult to do. Yeah. But but also it's important to remember, like controlling for socioeconomic status tells us something, but not always the most relevant thing. Because I, if yeah. you say, oh, well, you can uh, increase the ethnic diversity of the school. And actually that does, I mean, this isn't true, but suppose it was true that that doesn't have an effect. If you control for socioeconomic status, it's like, okay, well then maybe that could justify increasing the ethnic diversity of the school. So long as the ethnic diversity was being increased via a set of minority students who had the same socioeconomic status. Uh, but sure. And then you also run into the problem of for it. one, one so of your good. controls, what you could be controlling away, theoretically, the problem as well, right? That it might be the case that the socioeconomic status is deferring as a result of what it is you're trying to measure. And if you do control that particular thing, then you've erased everything that you're trying to study is possible as well, right? Yeah, that, 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 that's correct. So we do want to be uh, careful with controlling for that. So do, do you disagree with the basic take that I gave on the, the little Timmy question there? Um, I, the, the problem is that like, it's such a one dimensional view of both race and, and bullying. It's hard to imagine. Like, I'm sure that there are people that get bullied in the United States, um, depending on like the type of school they go to and depending on like, like who they are, but it's hard to imagine like a one-off case of like, this person is going to get bullied for this reason over this, or this person gonna, like, I, that's just a really hard thing to conceptualize. I'm sure that in the future, there's going to be some kid that gets bullied for being white. Uh, it might be the case that in, in the future, some people get bullied for not being mixed race, or some people get bullied for being mixed race, right? You've got like the whole HAPA thing with uh, Asian people as well. Uh, it's hard to predict who's going to get bullied for any particular thing um, for, for any reason. So it's not, I just don't engage with it much, I guess. So I, maybe I've interpreted the little Timmy question a little differently because, I mean, to my knowledge, there are no studies on the rate at which uh, black and white people bully each other in school for the race that they are. Uh, but but there is a, a research, uh, there's a fair amount of research on just the degree of bullying overall. And so do, do you disagree with the statement that probably as the ethnic diversity of schools increases, the rate at which white people, not necessarily for their race, but just the overall rate at which white kids are being bullied is probably going to increase because these groups have higher bullying rates than the white kids do. Um, it, I mean, that almost necessarily seems like it would probably be the case. I imagine it would go in both directions as well. That anytime you have like, um, anytime you have a school with like one of X and 99 of Y, as the X moves from one to 99 and the Y moves from 99 to one, like the rates of bullying are going to increase and decrease accordingly. That would be my guess. So that might be true, but that would be a separate mechanism from the fact that if one group just on average bullies people more, right, then they, as their proportion increases, that's going to increase the bullying rate uh, for a reason that doesn't have to do with like the exact composition. Like it, it doesn't have to do with white people being so few that they can be sort of easily targeted because they're like 2% of the school or something like that. Um, I mean, in if you're trying to ask a more pointed question of like, well, I don't know how pointed the question is. If you're trying to say that like black people are more prone to bullying white people and as they grow in numbers, they will be more likely to be bullies. Is that like the, the question you're trying to get at more or am I being too precise with that? Well, the, the white people are, uh, the black people are more likely to, to bully, black people are more likely to bully white people mm -hmm. than vice versa. And that as a result of that, um, and minority students in general, uh, and that as a result of that, as schools become more diverse and the white percentage becomes lesser, what you'd predict is A, an increase in the bullying rate overall in the schools in a certain sense, but also more importantly for our conversation, just an increase in the rate at which the white kids are being bullied. Um, I mean, it's I, not yeah, I mean, like, again, like, the, the, the numbers on their own wouldn't surprise me, but then obviously we, we're going to have to start roping in like SES stuff as well. And then we're going to have to hope that like all of that is being adequately controlled for in a way that doesn't control away our question. And in a way that, um, yeah, that like if you had a school for instance of like very, very wealthy, you know, black African exchange students or something, and then like some white people went to that school, my guess is those white people probably won't be as bullied as if they go to school, like in a shitty neighborhood in like Detroit or something or Chicago or DC or well, that would be my guess. So it's probably hard to like divorce these issues from each other. I don't, I don't know how you would get like a, a good capture of like who's being bullied for what and why. Sure. So, so again, I mean, the group differences in bullying do persist when you control for various sort of environmental measures. Um, and to me, I don't, so this feels like I'm not exactly sure what we're even arguing about at this 
moment because it's a separate question of why the bullying rates are higher, but it's just the simple fact that if, if you have a school, then let's just get rid of race, but you have the, the fucking bully school and the non-bully school and you bring a bunch of the, and I, I'm making these examples like very monolithic groups is unrealistic, but it's just an extreme example to make the point that obviously if you take a bunch of kids in the bullying school and put them in the school full of non-bullies, well, the rate at which those non-bully kids are going to get bullied is now higher. Well, I mean, the subject of why the bullying happens is kind of material to the conversation, right? Because obviously on my end, I'm going to say that bullying is going to be like a very complex interaction between, uh, you know, like, what is your household like? What is your socioeconomic status like? Um, what is the school like? And your explanation, I'm guessing, is probably falling a bit heavier on the like, certain racial groups are more biologically prone to aggression or violence at early ages. So, I mean, I think that's, it's kind of, that is kind of the point of like what we're talking about, right? That's the goal of why you, um, well, yeah, or, or that's my impression. I'm not trying to yeah, put that in here, but yeah. So I, I do think what you accuse me of thinking, uh, but- to, Oh, I'm sorry, real quick. Time, I'm not trying to care. That's, this is just my takeaway of, of what you're saying. But if, if that's not your position, you can always correct me. I'm not trying to like say like, oh, you're saying black people have like the bully gene or whatever, but it feels like you're trying to get to that. When you say um, like, well, when we control for all of these things, you know, that's, black people still bully. Yeah, go for it. You know, I, I think that there are, there's a, at least partially genetic cost to these sorts of differences. That's a, a fair uh, thing to say. But at, at the same time, when we talk about an environmental explanation, we're talking about like the real practical reality of the situation. What really matters is the modifiability of the causes, not whether or not they're genetic or environmental. Because if you say something like, oh, well, it's because black people are poor and it's because uh, these other groups are poor. And that's why when we increase the integration of schools, white kids end up being bullied more. So the the conclusion, so don't worry, white people only follows if you also think, and black people are about to not be so poor anymore. We're about to fix that finally, right? And if you don't think that, and it doesn't require you to think a genetic explanation is true, if any explanation you think, if you don't think that's going to be fixed anytime soon, then the, then the then white people still would have a cause to be, you know, somewhat concerned about it. Um, yeah, potentially, or wealthy people might have cause for concern for certain types of integrations. I mean, I don't necessarily disagree with that, but the cause is going to be important because remedying, you know, like shitty socioeconomic status is going to be a lot easier than remedying some perceived genetic deficiency, right? Like, it, for, mm -hmm. like for instance, if we, let's say, um, so it's I'm going to, I'm going to borrow from things that I, I believe are, are, are pretty true. Um, so let's say for instance, that kids eating breakfast or having access to high quality food can be like a pr big predictor for mood or things like aggression or, you know, how they perform in school. Um, and let's say that it is the case that, um, you, l l now I'm making a big assumption here. I'm not saying this is true, but let's say we make the big assumption that like that, that can explain away like 85% of bullying in a given school. Now let's say that you have a school and you start to integrate more of like the bully crowd into this school, but then you also say, okay, well, since we're integrating more of these people, we're also going to begin providing, you know, like high quality breakfast and high quality lunches to these kids as well. Um, that would be an instance where you're integrating more of the bullies, but you're getting rid of one of the prime causes of the bullying. But now if we're going to say that like, well, the bullying is caused primarily by a genetic component, not all, but we'll say primarily by a genetic component, then no amount of, um, you know, dealing with the causes is going to be sufficient short of like some CRISPR massive gene editing shit that is clearly beyond us right now. So I think that the causes of the bullying are pretty important here because we can realistically shore up one and probably not the other for some decades decades to come gotcha so i don't um yeah i, I don't necessarily agree with that uh, on, on the one hand sometimes differences that are genetically caused are very solvable um as a, as a kind of evapid example my eyesight isn't particularly good because of genes so mm -hmm. glasses um in, in the case of something like uh like i don't like unruly kids or something like that it could be as simple as oh uh a, a different approach to the schooling, right? Like a stricter approach or something like that. And I'm not saying that that would necessarily work. I'm just saying that it does not, I, I don't think obviously follow that, oh, because the cause of this is genetic, the remedy for it has to be genetic. That often in fact, that is just not the case. Um, although in the future, genetic remedies for problems are going to become uh, quite ubiquitous. And similarly, uh, there are some environmental causes and I don't think this is true, but let's say that the cause was, oh, single parent homes. It's like, okay, well then fix that. And even if the cause of the single parent homes was itself entirely environmental, right? That's not a, that doesn't mean, oh, it's environmental. So it's going to be easy to fix. Yeah. Both right? of those are absolutely so, true. Ge some genetic things are easy to take care of and some environmental things are almost impossible to take care of. I don't disagree with that. Sure. We can probably go into the Q and A if you guys want. Or, or where we can finish out this topic or we can do one more if you want. Well, he, um, I know that Sean has a, um, about what an hour and a half left uh yeah that's correct 
Yeah, so I mean, I don't know if uh, they like. The, the, the Q&A is my, I, I don't know, I, I I don't know what the questions are. They might get us more to yeah, maybe they might points of a strong a disagreement because I feel like it a weird, because it's weird because I know that we disagree uh, extremely heavily on this and mm -hmm. a very, but the conversation thus far has not been uh, as because pointed about over. the disagreements. <laughs> Yeah, so I think the, the so the problem is well because I'm pretty sure you're I don't I'm trying to hard not to like straw man or, or mischaracterize your position, but I know that you fall more heavily on like the race realist side of things if that's an expression that you would use. Um, but I think that like um, if you're intelligent about it, then you avoid a lot of the major pitfalls um, that some people that have those viewpoints represent. So for instance, like um, saying things like a genetic deficiency is impossible to correct in an environment. That's obviously not true. Um, or saying that there might be like a, like a single gene or like a, a, you know, a single nucleopeptide or whatever that controls for like aggressive behavior that, you know, like these are like a lot of like the dumber kind of arguments. I think that broadly speaking, um, and this is kind of like my point, if, if we go like really macro, broadly speaking, it might be the case that there are some group genetic differences um, in people that will predict different types of behavior or capabilities. That might be the case. I would argue, one, that it's never going to fall as cleanly along certain lines, especially with all the uh, racial mixing or interbreeding, or whatever you call it, that's happened over the past few decades. And two, uh, it, it's not usually, I don't believe it's going to be like as serious or unsolvable environmentally as some people on the right say. But it, to get into those points, I think we like very specifically have to debate like, okay, we're going to argue, um, you know, like the genetic determined part of intelligence now and see like what remedies like it has to be like a more specific debate than just like great migration or great replacement, I think. Yeah. Um. <laughs> So I'm trying to say it's your fault, Brittany. You fucked up the topic. Hardcore. <laughs> I wanted to do the you race realism, it up. but you were gonna, we've been postponing this debate for so long. I've been um, busy. I've been fucking hard. traveling in Europe, hanging out with my ethno-European well, friends, rude. okay? <laughs> Jesus, <laughs> fuck you. What the hell? Um, okay, I'm just going to go into the Q&A. All right, so from uh, Will's son, is it instinctively wrong uh, for an indigenous people desiring to remain majority in their ancestral homeland if so, why? If not, what's wrong with white Europeans desiring to remain majority within their ancestral homeland? Um, is that to me or to Sean? Um, guessing it's to you. Uh, I think it is ultra cringe when people are willing to defend some groups like uh, racial uh, heterogeneity and not others or homogeneity. Um, so. I, I, I think it, I, I think that left-leaning people fall into all sorts of weird traps when they talk about like how important it is um, for some group that they can like maintain their racial purity and that that ought to be protected and respected or whatever. I, I, I never I never buy into those arguments. I think that's really strange. But I will say though, on a on a second thing, at the very least, like a native or indigenous population probably has a stronger claim to their like ethnic purity than just white Europeans which again is like such an American expression that I think is so meaningless if you actually go to Europe. So I, I think that, that that grouping is like so weird to me. There are so many other ways you can group white people in the United States than just white Europeans. Okay. Um, from Bash the Fash, Spank the Tank. Cool name. Sean, is it not in the interest of our gene pool to reduce the existence of low quality individuals from within our own gene pool who drag us down? uh sure i mean that's a rather crude way of of phrasing that and obviously uh you have to do i mean so improving the quality of the people in your nation rather through environmental or genetic means is a valid policy goal now obviously there have to be ethical constraints of how you do that um but as long as it's within obvious ethical constraints uh so for instance just a simple example uh encouraging people um, and maybe even via some like tax power or something, encouraging people to engage in embryo selection, something like this when they have a kid, right? Like there's, I, as long as the cost benefit analysis borne out the fact that that would be uh, unnet beneficial, like there's, I don't know what the serious objection to that kind of thing uh, could possibly be. 
Um, let's see. Do you have, can I ask uh, a question to Sean for that? Just, I'm curious. Yeah, you guys, you can do that. Do you ever worry that like the certain certain embryo selections might seem self-evident, but in the future it like dooms a population because they're selecting for things that they think are positive but aren't actually? So like if I give an example, oh, yeah. yeah, like let's say there's like an alien invasion and all of our computers are fried and the only people that can win the wars are these like hyper autistic savants that can calculate like missile trajectories on like the off on the fly. They can do this, but we've like edited out all of the autistic people and now we've lost that quality from the human. Is that like an, an issue that you think could come up with embryo selection? Uh, yeah, and I, I would say, well, a few things about that. So firstly, um, we can ask the question, it's true that via a centrally a kind of planned embryo selection, we might end up with a population that is not well suited for some future problem. But mm -hmm. of course, is there a reason to think that that probability is higher than if it's being done via the natural mating preferences of people? Maybe, maybe not. Um, in, in the second place, I think it makes sense to maintain a lot of diversity among humans, uh, even in the future when we have very advanced gene editing, that what you really want to do is just get everyone past a certain threshold and not literally make make everyone the same, right? Like we, we don't need, we don't need murderers, but everyone does not need to have the exact same personality, that sort of thing. And, and then in the third place, I would say that I actually have an active political concern about a variant of the kind of thing you're talking about, because uh, gene editing just is going to be a reality uh, in, in the not super distant future. And whether, if, if the institutions that implement gene editing and the societal norms that govern how people decide to implement gene editing are either um, very, woke or very Chinese, uh, I think that they could lead to the selection of some very problematic things. And then they might, and then I think it's a serious probability that, that will happen. So when you say that the, uh, so like diversity of genetic um, traits in the future could potentially help us for some future problem. Are you saying that diversity is our strength? I'm sorry, I'm done. Okay. Um. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm just gonna go on. Um, from Pepsi Man, it appears that last overvalues the contributions of whites in the U.S. context. Hasn't that benefits of a white castle? Wait, hasn't I'm guessing he meant hasn't the benefits of a white castle um, have run its course? What the fuck is this? Haven't the benefits? I'm to... guessing that's what he meant. Haven't the benefits of whites run its course? Something we went on. Uh, I mean, no, I don't think the benefits, I, I'm not exactly sure what the question is. The benefit, the benefits of white people existing is not in, if that, if that is actually the question. Yeah, it seems like he's uh, saying that we're, it's run its course and maybe, I don't know. I don't know what he's trying to fucking say in this one. Um, he's talking about the caste system, but yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Um, all right. I mean, on. the benefits of like. The cat, I, I, so to me, the, the white cast, I don't know what that would mean. Like, did the benefits of slavery run their course? It, 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 we ended it, so. If I take, like, the strongest interpretation of the question, it sounds like he's asking, like, maybe at some point in time, like, a white hierarchy helped us get to a certain point in time, and now the white hierarchy ends, and now, like, some other hierarchy exists that helps us go for I, I, That's my interpretation of it. I don't know. It's kind of a weird question. <laughs> um, all right. From Wilson's. In a recent Business Insider poll, half of Republican voters and half of Democratic voters favored secession. Um, between the left and right has reached the point of irreconcilable differences. So would you guys support, I guess, secessions? Uh, I, uh, I well, wouldn't, but yeah, go ahead. So, so a few things. So firstly, um, polling on secession is not very reliable in the United States. Um, because I've been sort of interested in very far right positions, I've been following it somewhat for a little more than a decade, and I, it's gone up and down quite tremendously via just because of the cause of short term political shocks. Um, in the second place, it's always important, and I don't, I've seen the headlines about that poll, but I haven't actually bothered reading it. I probably won't look into it seriously until some more polls come out reliably showing the same result. But it's always important to look at what people are willing to actually vote over, not just what uh, they say on a pollster they theoretically support because that is what actually impacts the political reality in the United States, uh, not just things that people in theory would support. Also, most people don't know anything about secession and the actual implications and ramifications of that, them saying they support it. They probably imagine everything will be just like it is now, except I won't share a nation with those goddamn X or Y. And that is, uh, if we ever had a serious political sort of discussion in the United States about secession, uh, 
it would become evident that it's a lot more complicated than that. Um, and then, and I only support secession in the case of a pretty extreme thing. Okay, and a lot of people on the right are gonna this is not gonna make people happy. Uh, but so, so the fact of the matter is that if you look at the world history, this is a thing having to do with global history that like the trend over the long period is towards ever expanding borders. And that's, if you think, you, and that has to do with uh, military power and the way the technology interacts with the beneficiality of interactions between people across geography. And if you think you can reverse that long-term trend, I think you're basically out of your mind. Now you can re reverse it in an area in a short-term way, um, but you need to be doing it for a reason that makes sense with a goal of say, in, in, you know, like a hundred year span or something like that. But the goal cannot be something like we're going to break off into our own nation and then we are going to be separate from the rest of the world and like not politically uh, mesh with them forever, which in my experience talking to a lot of ethno-nationalists um, tends to be their kind of attitude. And I don't think that's like, whether that'd be good or not, I just don't think that's realistic given the, the sort of mechanisms of history. Um, and so now, obviously, if, if like a group's being, you know, fucking like, look, if the United States goes goes postal, right, and white people are being slaughtered or something like that, then yeah, uh, that's a good reason to secede, even if it does only last for 100 or 200 years or something like that. Uh, but 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 if the issues are, are, are much more uh, minor, I'm, I'm talking for a long time. I'll just it, it could be a very long thing. I think a lot of the issues that ethno nationalists can be concerned with can be dealt with within the context of one nation rather than actually breaking apart. I agree Sean, are you a globalist? So oh, sorry. I was gonna say, I agree real quick on the polling thing. P polling on like really complicated issues like that is really cringe. And when you start to poll more specifically, um, people's opinions will change vastly. Like I could totally see like a racist right-leaning person or some dipshit, you know, young, super left progressive being like, oh yeah, secession would be awesome. Like fuck those people. Like we're getting our own country now. Like without having any understanding of like the economic, political, uh, like travel implications of anything they're saying. That, that, so yeah, I would put very little stock in that type of polling. Um, from okay, back. these Q and A's need to talk in some kind of area where we can have. All right, let's do. Bash the fetish, <laughs> take the table seat here. Um, Sean, should not I, as a high IQ European, prefer, for example, Koreans over white Americans to increase positive outcomes for my offspring, as well as reduce harmful mutations that arise in isolated gene pools? Geisum, Iceland. So that I mean that. That's a pretty complicated question. Should you prefer <laughs> Korean genes for your offspring? Um, so in the first place, there's a lot of research. Um, I should put this. Okay, so there's a bunch of things. A, IQ is not the only thing that determines a person's worth. If you wanted to do some kind of overall genomic analysis of the value of a person, you'd have to engage with a lot more than IQ. Secondly, um, there are special problems that do come up for mixed race children. Uh, there's a, I think most of the research on this actually is on um, biracial, half Asian, half white Americans. And that research tends to show that there's a lot of um, psychological issues that, that come from them feeling that they don't fit in anywhere. There's been similar studies with mulatto kids. Um, but obviously, like, that's not going to, I think these questions are kind of so silly. Like, when you decide who you have kids with, this is not, I, I, unless you're like really obsessed with politics, this is not going to be what it is. And it may be that you don't want to have kids with Koreans for like a, a more base reason. In which case, uh, not based, I mean base reason. Uh, and if that's true, I mean, then sure, that's fine, whatever, but then you're just not going to. And this kind of argument, I don't think is going to convince someone. Um, and there's nothing, like, the question is kind of, it's not like I think it's unethical to, to have kids with someone of another race or something like that. I don't know, the, the question was a little... Here, here's like a question that I would have for like somebody would ask a question like this So like let's say that you are of the paradigm that you're trying to maximize the IQ of your children So you're trying to select like the the biggest brained high IQ Korean you have If they're gonna share that value with you, why the fuck would they want to have kids with you as a white person? Shouldn't they just be preferring like high IQ other Korean people? Like why would they like why would they breed down with the lesser IQ person? I don't understand Well presume I mean I think that he called himself a high IQ European, so... Yeah, but he's watching Twitch IQ streams and YouTube IQ. streams, so, I mean, let's... How I, here I, are we here, okay? I'm just... I'm just yeah, but... Uh, here, uh, here's, like, actually... Here's, like... Uh, okay, hold on. This might actually be a, a, a question um, that, that spawns some disagreement, okay? So here's one problem that I'll have with... Um, 
with, with race realist people that, and it sounds like you're you're not just gonna obsess over only IQ, okay? But it's, I'm sure that IQ is one of these things that we, we both agree is, is pretty important. Um, if we were worried about like the IQ health of a country, why wouldn't we have an immigration policy that like restrictively selects for IQ rather than just race? Like, wouldn't it be beneficial? Let, let's even, I'll, I'll grant like a million different um, foundational things. Let's say that white people, or let's say that Asian people were higher IQ than like white people who are IQ than black people who are higher IQ or whatever. Let's say that we grant all of those things. Wouldn't we still want to exclude from our immigration policy low IQ white people and still include from our immigration policy high IQ black people? Wouldn't that still be the case or no? So, so there are a couple things to say about that. Um, there, at some level, that's going to be true. Uh, there, are, there are technical reasons for which determining which one has a higher genetically, genetic propensity towards IQ is going to be somewhat complicated, uh, even if you have the raw IQ scores. But um, I mean, my position on this essentially is that as of now, we have a problem, which is that when immigrants come here, they politically assimilate into a subculture of the United States, which has... Uh, in my view, a profound anti-white bias. As long as that is true, that gives me a sort of basic reason for not liking immigration just writ large. Do you... But if we can fix that no, the ahead, issue, sorry. though, um, then in, I would support a quite you know meritocratic immigration system and not one based on mm -hmm. simple racial quotas. So here's a question that I have for you. And maybe you're pulling data on this. And okay, I, so I have a lot of real life experience with this, unfortunately, and I hate it. But when I think of anti white bias that I've encountered in the real world, like when I do political activism or whatever, I have very rarely ran into anti white bias from, like, I don't know if I ever really have from Hispanic people. It is incredibly rare. And even black people, it feels like most of the anti white bias comes from, like, young white progressives. In terms of like anti-white bias and how it plays out like on a larger, now I know that there are like different Twitter talking heads where, you know, you've got like Brianna, um, the um, lady that was uh, the Bernie Sanders person, obviously she has a lot of anti-white bullshit. Um, and I'm sure that we can find like big media figures that are representative of this. But do you feel like as a whole, when it comes to like anti-white bias in the United States, do you think this originates more from like Hispanic people who in my personal opinion don't seem to give a fuck about this shit as much? Or do you think it just comes from like young white progressive people that tend to be overwhelmingly white? So I think that there are <clears throat> two different kinds of biases we can talk about. Uh, Hispanic people in the United States, I think, don't – well, they're, they're normal for ethnic groups in the sense that they have a bias. I would characterize it as in favor of themselves. Same with black people. Um, and that this can often lead to conclusions that I think are unfair to white people such as the problem with our community is that white people did X to us. Now, a bias that is not in favor of your own group, but specifically against white people, and that's the whole thing. Yeah, that kind of thing is going to be primarily manifested among white people. And there are differences between those, um, but the sort of political ramifications of them, I think, are generally fairly similar, although, although some of the social ramifications are not. Some of the most insane... Uh, anti-white social ramifications, I think, are probably more concentrated among the sort of woke white people. Mm -hmm. Okay, I was just curious. Um, okay. From, uh, I mean, this seems like a bit of a similar question, but uh, from Vosh Fan, actually, it seems really similar. But uh, Vosh Fan says, if high and very low IQ people mix, won't a country eventually be lower IQ overall? Wouldn't that affect tons of industries, social behaviors, voting? If high and low IQ people mix, the mean IQ of the country will not change, assuming that all those people are already in the country. Now, it is true, though, that the, um, the say, the mean IQ of the 95th percentile will decrease. Uh, and that is quite bad because a lot of the relationship that IQ has with national development has to do not with what the average person does, but rather with how smart the smartest people in the country are. I'm using smart here to obviously just mean the cognitive abilities that IQ measures it could mean something broader but whatever we'll set that to the side um so in that so so like in in, in that sense it would be problematic okay um Vashpan says do genetics influence voting for more authority oh yeah i mean there's no 
question about that. The heritability of political opinions is, is not zero. Um, the Real Hydro. Destiny, why in every debate you claim you're not trying to straw man, but yet it's all you do? I don't think I try. Everybody accuses me of trying to straw. I think I make a pretty good effort to try to understand what the other person is saying. If I, if I don't, I usually say this at the beginning of a debate. I didn't at this one, but I usually say at the beginning, like, if you feel like I'm mischaracterizing you, feel free to correct me. Um, if anybody ever feels like I'm straw they can always say, now, I, Tristan obviously felt that way, but I, I mean, I try to have a decent understanding of what the other person is saying. Um, otherwise, we're just going to be screaming at each other. Um, to to maybe add to the thing about authoritarianism, um, to maybe make it a little more uh, the previous question to make it a little more substantive. Not only is it true that twin studies show that there is a significant heritability of I think we, we've had snip based heritability estimates of this too, of political orientation, um, but also there is reason to think that that differs by group. There are certain genes that are associated with uh, individualism nationally and nonconformist attitudes individually that are more common in some groups than others and they correlate with national levels of individualism and the like um there's also measures of like genetic distance from the most individualist countries and that being highly correlated with individualism in a way that is true after you control for various geographic differences um it's not the most studied thing uh by far but it would not be implausible to, to suppose that there's a significant genetic contribution. But again, this is complicated because genetic contribution does not mean uh, immovability. And if you look at any group over time, no one can hold the view that uh, the, you know, political orientation is just like the stable thing that never changes in a population. So that's yeah, and I think even uh, you probably honestly don't want to listen. But even when you talk about like the heritability of a given thing, like heritability is in some ways disconnected from like the genetic determination of a trait as well, right? So for instance, like. Um, like the number of arms we have, I think that the heritability of that is considered to be quite low because heritability explains the difference um, in a population between given traits that can be explained by genetic differences. So for instance, if one person has one arm and another person has two arms, chances are that it's gonna explain more by an environmental factor rather than a genetic factor. So even though that's a highly genetically determined trait, it's still very low on the heritability. So something can be like high or low heritability, but still be high or low in terms of the genetic determination of that uh, given trait. Yeah, that's that's true. And you can't do a, a study to to get at this, but in theory, you could talk about something like, well, the heritability of the difference between arms, where the study population includes the entire animal kingdom, right? Then we would start to see uh, the kind of it would, it would reflect the fact that it's a profoundly genetic thing. But of course, you couldn't mm -hmm. actually ever do that. Sure. From Ben Baldivia. From my understanding, IQ is not a good indicator of success. Why is it that IQ should be specifically selected for attribute in the first place? Uh, so I, I think that one of the biggest mistakes that people make on the left is um, I think that sometimes people desperately want to get rid of numbers that might lead them to places that are uncomfortable to talk about or uncomfortable to analyze. Um, it reminds me of conversations about BMI. Uh, I, IQ is almost absolutely an incredibly important measurement, and if you just try to pretend to ignore it, you're just going to miss so much in the real world. Um, I and you can try to like explain away all you want. You can talk about different types of intelligences. You can talk, and I do agree that there are IQ shouldn't be everything. You know, there are tons of different reasons why people, um, you know, can contribute to society in different ways. But to just hand wave and say like, oh well, IQ means nothing. You're missing. You're 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 delusional or you're lying to yourself. Uh, to try to, to try to say something like that like it is incredibly um advantageous to be existing with higher iq in a society especially one that's so like technologically uh, uh like you you have to have a grasp on technolo technology and high, higher uh, understandings of different concepts in order to like advance well in society I, I think that iq is really important you can't just like hand wave it away like oh who cares i think it's really stupid when people do that okay uh, obviously i agree with that um i would add that that you need no matter what you think the answer is, you need to have an explanation for group differences in IQ because I think I said this in the last debate I was on on this channel, but the fact of the matter is that if you have a statistical model trying to account for, say, racial differences in income, and you can add all the sort of easily, sort of the most common economic determinants of income, and there's still a gap that favors white people over black people. But if you add IQ to that regression, that difference reverses so that it is now, in fact, favoring black people. Um, and, that, and that's true of various life outcomes and so even in the group context if you ignoring the the difference is not a, a serious uh option you can have lots of explanations for why that is but you do need to have an explanation of why that is if you're going to talk about the causes of group differences okay 
Um, from Zayton to Sean last. If we only allow white Europeans to immigrate to the United States, which party do you think they're more likely to support, knowing how Europeans feel about guns and healthcare? So this is a, okay, so I don't know if, if people asking these questions think that I'm a white nationalist. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm not, like I just, it's not, it's not like hiding the power, I'm just, I'm just not. Um, now I, I can talk about what way they would lean. In fact, um, one of the reasons, there are many reasons, but one of the reasons why I'm not is because white people, when they immigrate here, vote for the Democrat party and white people that come from non sort of waspy kind well, not non Protestant countries tend to vote for the Democrat party for many generations. Even the ones that come from Protestant countries vote for the Democrat party for at least a generation or two. And so, um, like it, it, you can get a very misleading view of what the result of the immigration of different groups is going to be politically if you look at how the long-standing members of groups in this country vote uh, and you don't look at how the actual recent immigrants from each uh, racial group vote okay that's kind of i think kind of on the piggyback of that i think it's also kind of like a funny thing and it's one of the reasons why i'm glad republicans don't notice this and i feel like democrats are fucking it up but like the idea that like oh well if we just prefer white immigrants like I'm sorry, but you know, pe people coming from even from the UK, people coming from like Scandinavia are not flying to the United States to vote for Republicans. That's just that's never going to happen. It wouldn't surprise me if these people, especially in terms of social values, fell way further to the left than the average Hispanic voter who still believes like probably way more strongly in things like traditional family roles, um, you know, traditional like sexual orientations, uh, you know, like gender roles and stuff. Like the, the like Hispanic voters are probably going to align with the conservative voter there more than any white person coming from Scandinavia. Yep. Well, from Dan, the, the Nam, question for Sean Lass. How long have you been a white nationalist? Okay. Is this a troll that was just yeah, asked? Yeah, 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 I was right after he did a super chat. Um, okay, so from Cup of Tea, can you talk about your disagreements on whether laymen should rely on abstract studies because they're not qualified to dive into the methodology? Who's first? <laughs> um, I guess I can go yeah, first. Sure. That's sure. Sure. I mean, we could, we could talk about it all. That's not the the topic of the <laughs> debate. Um, with regards to reading abstracts, I mean, okay. And, and from the perspective of a layman, so this is somewhat complicated. Um, so first, we can ask the question: uh, Can you reliably understand research based on doing that kind of thing? Now, the answer to that is no, on two fronts. So in the first place, this is not true because we have research just, there's research on the accuracy of abstracts and there's a very high percentage of them that uh, when academics look at the paper and compare them to the abstracts, they say that the significantly mis misrepresented in some way. Um, the second place has to do with the, the second thing has to do with the limits of the researchers themselves. Uh, sort of, even if you don't look at the, uh, well, this is true of the abstracts and the written part of the paper as well. Uh, that researchers generally, in the social sciences at least, don't know what they're doing at a pretty profound level. Um, and, and there's a, like, th there's a set of people in the social sciences that are, that are sort of quantitative leaning, and they've been writing and doing studies on this for, for like decades, for a very long time. But the fact is, that if you go to social sciences and you give them, uh, quizzes on what basic statistical terms mean, uh, like p-values, confidence intervals, this sort of thing, that the majority of social scientists do not know what these things mean. And this has been replicated many times. And this is a profoundly horrifying thing because what, the, what this implies, because these sorts of values are in all of their papers, and this is, this is just true, that they are producing research and they literally don't know what the numbers mean, at least not exactly. Um, now, the laymen don't either, though. So to return this to the, like, the question, so I think of this well, I mean, to be frank, I think of this question normally from the perspective of someone who does know what a p-value is at a confidence interval. Um, and, and so from uh, the question of should I rely on the abstracts is different than the question should someone who doesn't know those things rely on the abstracts. And my view on that, honestly, is that uh, you can make a decision whether or not to try to base your political ideology on social science. Um, social science doesn't have the greatest reliability track record. It's not the end of the world if you decide 
not to. Uh, but if you decide to, and this is what I would ultimately encourage people to do, you should also gain a level of statistical literacy that will allow you to not have to read abstracts and, and, and rely on uh, sort of these authority readings of it. Um, and obviously people aren't going to do that, uh, but nonetheless, that is what I think they, they should do. And that's what the question was about, I think. Yeah, I think that in, in general, um, I, I think for the vast majority of people, abstracts are kind of the only thing you can go off of, unless you're an incredibly fucking weird person, like I guess anybody on this show, or maybe some people in the audience, like most people don't want to spend all this time like learning uh, you know, everything necessary to interpret a study. Uh, you know, like even I, like every time I go over things, I have to go and brush up on like, I don't remember what the fuck, uh, you know, like what is a confidence interval? What is a p-value? What is an effect size? Like these are things that I have to constantly remind myself or reread or rewatch, um, you know, like these fucking Stanford courses to understand. It's, it's a lot of information and it can be really difficult, especially if you're going through like a wide variety of literature. So like the types of uh, knowledge that you need in your head to interpret like an economic study is gonna be way different than like something epidemiological, which is gonna be way different than something related to like a social science um, and the idea that every single person can just acquire all of the knowledge necessary to interpret all of this I think is like pretty silly if you truly want to take the time to get like knowledge and or researched in a certain area and begin to read and understand things you can do it but you have to start at like pretty foundational levels that are pretty boring uh, like taking like a Khan Academy 101 stats class or like a like here's like the intro Stanford course on fucking you know biology or whatever and you have to be willing to put in a lot more work than most people are when they say they do their own research usually those people are just copy pasting memes uh from from the left or right like people do it i i would say to people uh, to make them maybe a, if, if anyone is actually seriously considering this that uh you don't have to be quite as as, as pessimistic about it. It, it like so there's a difference between learning how to conduct statistical analysis which is what you need to do if you're an academic and learning how to interpret statistical analysis, which is what you need to do if you're reading research, but not doing any yourself. And the amount of time it takes to learn to interpret research is significantly lesser than the amount of time. And there are books that are, that are, uh, that are oriented towards this. There are books on interpreting, uh, social scientific results rather than your standard statistical textbooks, which is largely on calculating statistical results. And so learning the interpretation is actually significantly, uh, easier, I think, than people imagine although it does still require you reading a, a book about math which some people will never do so um from Vosh oh no oh, sorry go ahead just one, one more thing I, I should add so again like this is me just like yelling at the wind because no one's gonna do this but uh like look we live in a clown world this isn't gonna happen but the real solution to oh but i can't understand this stuff so how should i form strong opinions about it is like you shouldn't and that's that that, that, that is the correct uh view on that i think Okay. Um, all right. So from Vosh Fan uh, said, if genes influence voting, is it really likely that importing third world low IQ people will lead to their kids voting totally opposite to their parents? I think we kind of addressed this with the earlier one. Like people, mm -hmm. I think most immigrants to the United States, my guess is going to be almost all immigrant groups tend to vote more democratically just because in the terms of like the world political sphere, I think the U.S., um, is a little bit further to the right on some issues when it comes to things like firearms or healthcare or like welfare benefits. So it, it wouldn't surprise me if most immigrant groups, I'm sure there are some notable, except, oh, Cubans were a notable exception for a while, although I think that's changed if it's not currently changing. Uh, most immigrant groups are probably going to vote more to the left than the right coming to the United States. There's, it's also worth noting that there's a, uh, like immigrants in most countries tend to vote for the so-called left, and that is at least in the first generation or two, because they tend to feel like the other basically. And the left tends to be the political side that represents, quote unquote, the other. And immigrants feel like the other for an obvious reason. And it's kind of inevitable in that sense. Okay. Um, from, uh, let's see here, from Castizo. Uh, let me see if I just lost it. Um, Sean, hypothetically, if your daughter introduced you to her black boyfriend, would you be cool with it? That is a uh... A weird, I mean, I don't, I don't have a daughter, so, uh, <laughs> well, um, like, like I said before, I don't think it's unethical for people to have interracial relationships. I mean, we could talk about that. Are, that we could talk about like, is there research showing that black and white relationships, particularly in the context of a white woman and a black male tend to, uh, 
lead to some bad outcomes on average. Yeah, that research does exist. Uh, on the other hand, um, if your daughter is sane, then you know, picking individuals rationally and whatnot, then that doesn't is, is not a necessary forecast of what's actually going to happen in that instance. I think on like a broader point related to this too, which is another issue I have with people that kind of like tend to fall on the, on the very far right side of this is like some people get way too involved with their political opinions such that those things start to like permeate all areas of their life. And I think what is like an unhealthy way. So like you might believe in all of these things um, related to IQ and race or whatever. And maybe they're even true. Maybe you believe in all things and maybe they're even true. But I, I think it gets a little bit weird or even, I wouldn't say weird actually. I would say a little bit mentally unhealthy when you're in this mindset of like, okay, I'm going to fall in love with and find the highest IQ Korean person to uh, have progeny with. And we're going to have 12 children and I'm going to get all of them like IQ tested. Like I think that whenever, whatever political ideology you have, when it starts to envelop that much of your life, I think your engagement with that becomes more than just these are my politics it becomes like a really weird uh club that you become like ideologically married to and can have really bad downstream effects in your life so i would i would caution i mean i say i make fun of people on the left for doing this a lot too but even on the right i think that that gets a little bit scary sometimes and then you end up in weird worlds where like you might have these really strong beliefs and then you start meeting people in real life and you're like fuck okay well this isn't lining up exactly and then you have this really horrible cognitive dissonance where um you know you get people like um uh, not Eric Stryker, the other one that I dated, who was like married to like a Jewish woman, but is also like incredibly alt right. And you, you just end up in all these weird areas where it's like, okay, like we can have broad political opinions about things, but when they start to dictate like aspects of our personal life, it's probably being engaged with in a pretty he unhealthy manner. Okay. Um, from again, from Bosch fan. Destiny, if the abstract of a study or meta study doesn't match the data, which takes precedence, the abstract or the data itself? Please tell Stardust. Um, that's a really hard one. Um, when, when the data disagrees with the abstract, it's going to depend on what that means. Uh, because some people will argue that data disagrees with the abstract because they don't understand how to interpret the data, which is why the abstract can be important. But it might also be the case that genuinely the abstract is misrepresenting the data or didn't draw the right conclusions from the data, in which case you would have to trust the data over the abstract. Although full data sets aren't always made available publicly, so it's hard to audit those. Uh, I, I don't think I can like, I, I mean, you can push me to answer that question, but I don't think I can give you like an honest answer. Like it's just going to depend on which one is correct, obviously. I would say that in general, bec because unless it's a topic and there are very few of these that I feel comfortable doing, this with, unless it's something I know a fuck ton about, I'm almost always going to err on the side of just reading the abstract and then just making sure I hopefully have some understanding that like, okay, the data kind of correlates to this. But when the data and the abstract disagree, unless I'm willing to do a ton of homework, I'm probably just going to say that, okay, the abstract is probably right. And there's just something that I don't understand about the data or the interpretation of said data. Okay. Uh, from Voshvan, Sean, do different races tend to have different in-group and out-group preferences? If so, does Destiny think it's reasonable to be concerned about that? Um, was this for so, me again or Sean? I don't know. I don't know why he's like, he just... Oh, he's I, asking I Sean if I should be concerned. Mind. Go for it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, so I'm, I'm not sure if he means differences in the degree of in-group preference and out-group preference or the difference in like the groups that they have preferences about. Um, certainly it is the case that non-white people have higher in-group preference than I'll be right back. Hold on one second. Well, I don't know if I should keep talking about what he should be yeah, go ahead, concerned fine. or not concerned about if he can't hear. Uh, <laughs> we can just talk shit. <laughs> <laughs> He'll never know. Um, yeah, no, you can keep talking if you want. Yeah, yeah well, I don't know. This is a... Well, we can just move on to the next question. Or... Weird. Oh, a, a weird debate. Uh, yeah, you guys uh, agreed on quite a bit. <laughs> yes, I've, I've tried to steer us into... Uh, <laughs> I'm telling you, I think, I think Destiny's kind of coming in. Uh, coming in. So all you DGGers that keep wanting to call me a Nazi... Um, Excuse me. <laughs> Get out of here. Um, hey, Sh okay, uh, Sean, really quick. What are some of your controversial takes on this topic? On, on what specific topic? Uh, on like the the racial issues and the, I guess, race realism. What are like your controversial takes? Well, I mean, as, as Destiny has, has said, I mean, I am a race realist. I think that the differences in, uh, in, th in behavioral and personality traits like IQ and uh, aggression and things like this are significantly genetically caused and that these in turn explain racial differences significantly in things like income and criminality uh, that are normally blamed on white racism. Um, I mean, I think genes are, I, that's the most controversial thing I think is that I think genes are hugely important to group differences. 
But, but you I've said this many it? times at the debate, but for some, but this is not some of become the, the thing where. But you, you so. it sounds like you kind of believe that could be changed over time through environment. Like, it, well, so do you believe it's genetic, but through time and you know different things in the environment, it, it can be improved on, improved on, or or made worse. Um, so, for instance, uh, uh, well, I mean, there, there are two things to say. Like, firstly. When we talk about an environmental cause, the most obvious way the environment can, can change genetic differences through the process of natural selection. Um, and it is, it is the case today that races, even in, in the United States, are evolving apart with respect to phenotypes like IQ, uh, which people don't uh, appreciate. That the, the racial gap didn't exist, even if the racial gap didn't exist genetically 40 years ago, it, it, it would now, uh, because the correlation between fertility and IQ differs by race and has for decades in the United States. Um, but yeah, I mean, you can, uh, it, what, it's just a case by case basis in terms of how easy a thing is to fix. Uh, but I think that normally to fix it, like if you think the cause is racism and it's genes, the chances of you fixing it is much lesser than if you recognize that it's genes and move from there. How is, isn't the rate of like, I don't know what the correct term is, not inbreeding, but like of different racial groups having children, hasn't that only increased over the past like few decades? Yeah. So how, how is it, how are we growing phenotypically apart if the groups are becoming more mixed? Well, even though it's, even though more uh, race mixing has occurred, um, that's a minority of people. The way that we're moving apart is that, and genetically speaking, is that within groups, there's a different degree of selection pressure. So in every racial group in the United States, there's a negative correlation between your IQ and your fertility, right? The smarter you are, the fewer kids you're having. Uh, our genotypic IQ is going to decrease for this reason. However, the strength of that relationship is much stronger in some groups than others. And so, in fact, you can look at the, the correlation between fertility and uh, IQ and the heritability coefficient within each group and make an exact prediction about the genetic separation by generation if you want to. But, but broadly speaking, but that's the, the mechanism involved. So you're, you're essentially saying that we're living in the movie Idiocracy. Well, genotypically, we're certainly moving that way. In the United States, the history of the last 100 years has been complicated because this, as we have been genetically uh, decreasing our, our mean genotypic IQ, the environment has improved uh, tremendously such that the it's, it's not as obvious, the genetic effect that, that has happened because we have so much better environments than we used to. But, but yeah, our genotypic IQ is, is, is decreasing. By you don't think that people today are exponentially smarter than people 40 years ago? Well, uh, this gets into another complicated question, which is that, um, well, so what does it even mean to be smarter? measure two broad kinds of abilities. There are, there is a general ability, which is a kind of general cognitive ability that underlies virtually all cognitive mechanisms that a person engages in. And IQ tests very highly correlate with that general intelligence. And then there are also specific abilities related to specific uh, IQ subtests and just mental abilities in general. And the trend in the United States, and I think globally, has been an increase in our specific ability level, but a decrease in our general intelligence level. And this is true just phenotypically before even talking about uh, the genetic differences. The general intelligence factor is what drives the predictive validity of IQ tests. And so for that reason, when we're talking about people who were alive 50 years ago, they may have had a lower mean IQ than us, but plausibly a higher general intelligence than us and if that's the intelligence that matters most for outcomes then you wouldn't say something like they were idiots that is the a complicated answer to that question is the um Can I... <clears throat> when you talk about general intelligence are you more specifically are you, are you referencing like g yeah the g factor is that is that something that's still like rel or my understanding is that that's still relatively contentious that the the hope is that at the very least, IQ maps onto G factor, or there's like some underlying G factor. Isn't this still something though that people think is like they're not sure if it's like one thing or a multitude of things, or what, or if that factor even exists as as itself? Is, is this still like a contentious topic? So the existence of the factor as a statistical phenomena is not uh, contentious at all. Mm -hmm. um, how to explain the phenomena is a phenomenon is uh, somewhat contentious, although. I don't know if there's a poem. This my read of intelligence research certainly is that most of them believe in so-called G theory, uh -huh. uh, which is what I'm talking about. But there are different interpretations. Uh, but obviously, I'm representing my viewpoint here. Sure. Um, Bob Ross 
Destiny has gotten a lot less shrill and dishonest since last heard him speak. Keep it up, Destiny. No cap. Thanks. I try to work on my dishonesty every day, you know. <laughs> um, all right. From uh, Dan the Nam, Sean, so then if not white, would it be fair to say off-white or eggshell nationalism? Pearl, perhaps? Okay. <laughs> um, from Le Le Perlerm? I don't know what he said. Um, please, Brittany, bring up John Sean and the race, wealth, and crime issue. It was the biggest thing on the entire internet a few years ago. I don't know what they mean by that, but maybe you guys do. Oh, uh, well, I think that, that, that isn't this a thing where um, Destiny had a debate with John Tron. John Tron said something like, oh, "John Tron, a person." <laughs> okay. Wow, isn't that his name? <laughs> he is a I person. Have no yeah. idea. Brittany's just Amazing. booming out hardcore right now. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> uh, but but he made a claim that um, like rich black people tend to have higher crime rates than do poor white people, uh, which is is true so far as we can tell. Um, I think Destiny had some rebuttal to that, so maybe that's what they want us to talk about. So the issue was there's like a graph that was listed that shows like the, I think it was like the wealthiest white neighborhood or the poorest white neighborhood versus the wealthiest black neighborhood or something. And um, the argument went on to say that like black people commit crime even in the wealthiest neighborhoods and white people don't. And there, there were two issues. So the most simplistic take was that there was no way to figure out how that particular data had been arrived at. Um, I think we tried to email the Bureau of Justice Statistics to see if they, they had any idea and they don't keep like racial data in that context. Um, and then the guy that actually made the graph, I think from, or made the, the little chart thing from 4chan ended up DMing me and was like, oh yeah, I made that. I had no idea that would be a huge meme. Um, secondly, the more important conversation topic, I think, and I was less informed on this at the time, the more important conversation topic is that like, Poverty and crime, like in some ways are highly correlative, but then in other ways aren't actually. I don't know if just looking at poverty is the best way to predict um, if there's going to be high crime in an area. So for instance, there's probably a lot of very poor uh, rural communities that don't have very much crime. Um, and there's probably a lot of very wealthy communities, uh, especially wealthy urban communities that have a substantial amount of crime. So it wouldn't surprise me that I could go around to some of the poorest communities in the United States and say like, oh, look, there's like no crime here. You know, I'm from Nebraska. I could probably drive out, you know, very far west past Elkhorn and find like, uh, and farther west into the no man's lands and find like poor towns with no crime. And then I can also probably walk around, you know, places in, I don't, I don't know if Beverly Hills is like a super safe area to be at at night, um, or West Hollywood, or, um, you know, like Brenton or any of these like cities, you know, in, in Los Angeles, even though these are incredibly wealthy places. So I just, I don't think that's like a very meaningful way to talk about crime or race or anything. So, so, so with regard to the first thing, I would say that, um, so there've been multiple studies that have found that high income blacks have higher crime rates than low income why it's, this is true in terms of incarceration rates. Uh, and I think incarceration rates match crime rates very closely, but some people don't. But it is also true in terms of homicide victimization rates. Uh, and that data, I don't know if someone like made their own graph of the data or something, but the data on that does come from either academic research or government reports. Um, with, with regard to the effect of poverty on crime in general, so the causal effect of poverty, I think our best estimate is that it doesn't have a causal effect on crime. Um, the reason for this is that even though it is true that poor people on average tend to have higher crime rates, um, research has shown that, like, if you compare, for instance, siblings in a family, and a family that has had a trajectory of income over time, and you ask the question, is it true that the sibling who grew up when the family was poor is more likely to be a criminal than the sibling who grew up when the child, when the family was not poor? The answer to that is no. Um, and so what, what researchers say is that, this shows that the association is due to um, the word is unobserved family confounds. Now, uh, that could be a cultural thing or a genetic thing, but it's important to realize that if it's a cultural thing, it is not a cultural thing that is caused by poverty. It would be a cultural thing caused by something else because the, the causal effect of poverty on crime, uh, especially violent crime, doesn't seem to be very significant at all. At the, at the household level or the neighborhood level, there are similar studies about neighborhood deprivation. Okay, um, from Voshfan, Destiny, would you be in favor of banning all immigration, any race, with sub 80 IQ? Not kicking anyone out, but from now on, no import of low IQ people. Is that to me or to Sean? It's to you. Um, 
I, I think that the problem is when you start selecting, I, I think you would have to put forth really strong arguments to select specifically for IQ. Um, and then I think making restrictive immigration policies centered around IQ would be, I think, dicey at best. Um, I, I think that if I were to do, if we could enact like perfect immigration policy, I think that some of the policies I would choose might end up being like a proxy for IQ. So for instance, if you're immigrating to the United States, I think that that selection should be made on the basis of economic opportunity, not on the basis of like rent capture, like uh, getting welfare, basically. Um, and it might be the case that the majority of the economic opportunity that exists at this point in the United States is for people with higher than 80 IQ. So if that was the case, then I guess my immigration policy would, um, in a roundabout way, select for 80 IQ and higher. Uh, but it might also be the case that there are positions in the United States for people with less than 80 IQ that can do things. So, uh, yeah, I, I just I don't think I would select for that particular trait um, explicitly, but maybe other selections I would make would work as a proxy for that. Um, from Voshvan, Destiny, are there any downsides to mass immigration? Is immigration only a positive in every area? Is there no benefit to homogeneity? Don't say food. Um, first of all, food is awesome. Um, but... Uh, <laughs> I, I, when people say mass migration, I don't know what they mean. I don't, I don't know anybody that supports mass migration except for like the most extreme, extreme people on the left. Like I don't, nobody wants like 100 million people moving from South America into the United States, or at least I haven't heard that. Um, it, but now, so like the, what is mass migration is, is already like a content, contentious topic. But let's say that it's like, a, we'll just define it as an immigration that, level that I'm okay with, that other people aren't okay with, or that I'm okay with it at a higher level than other people would be. Uh, I, I don't generally see much value in homogeneity. Um, I just, I, I just, I personally don't. Um, I know that, I, I think that the readings around that are still like pretty contentious in terms of like when you mix different racial groups, is there like less, um, I think like it's like social trust or whatever. Um, but I, I think that all of these things are incredibly complicated matters that don't boil down as simply to like the way that people look or their ethnic background. Um, I think there's a whole bunch of environmental factors that can be played up or, or dealt with before like saying we can't have different groups of people mixing together. And if I was to go to the direction where I'm like, okay, this isn't working anymore, I don't think I would ever just draw the line at like white people, brown people, black people, Asian people. Like I think it would, it would the the white thing would be drawn around like so so many more discrete lines. I think than that because it just white people in this country are so dissimilar depending on where you go from, and even Hispanic people are. I just don't think I would draw the lines around that area. Yeah. Okay. Um, from Boschman. Thank you, by the way, Boschman, for all the super chats. <laughs> um, uh, Destiny, if low IQ leads to low impulse control, isn't it uh, good to factor that into dating? A low impulse kid is in for a rough time in school socially. And I mean, high IQ people are sometimes serial killers. I just, I don't think I would make that particular personal life selection based off of broad, like, strokes. I would just, I would never do that personally. Okay. I'd also say that... Um... If, you're, if what your concern is is actually impulsivity, then the thing you want to look for in your partner is, is impulsivity. That's going to be a much better predictor than is a sort of related confam. Although there's nothing wrong with, I mean, wanting a smart partner or something like that, just to, to be clear. That is something that a lot of people have a preference for. Okay. From Bash the Fash. Sean, why don't we just select higher IQ people of color uh, for reproduction and over time reduce the rate of criminality by influencing the gene pool? No need for racial segregation. I mean, I've literally talked about embryo selection. I mean, yeah, I, I agree with using uh, genetic technology to, to and just simple old fashioned cons uh, consenting eugenics to sort of remove genetic inequalities that exist that are problematic. And there are genetic inequalities that are not problematic that we don't need to remove. But, uh, yeah. Um, from Spook Trick Griper, Come Home Destiny. Okay. Nice. <laughs> from Yip Yam, if a man and woman edit their baby genes, is it really their child? Wait, if a man and a woman have a children that don't have their genes, is it really... Say that again? Sorry, what? If, if a man and woman edit their baby's genes, is it really their child? Um, yeah, this is like a... This is like a... You're asking me to solve the ship of Theseus. I, I, I have no idea. How many epigenetic modifications does it take for something to not resemble? Or like, does enough sufficient radiation damage? Or like, what about enough uh, implants? You've got like kidneys and... I, I, don't, I don't know. That's a, It's an interesting question, but I don't know the answer to that. Or maybe Sean has a strong opinion or not about that. I don't know. 
Well, I mean, that's just sort of a, I mean, it's just a semantic question, right? Of how you want to define quote your kid unquote. And I think the way most people use the word, we would say that it's still their kid. I've never heard anyone deny that say, Oh my gosh, you, yeah, I don't know why gene editing would be special. You can just go to someone, Oh my gosh, you, you, you like embryo selection could be the same thing, I guess. Well, I guess not because it's still from the person. But yeah, I don't, I don't think anyone would say it's not your kid anymore. And if we wanted to get really autistic about it anyway, we could talk about the fact that you're not going to be altering certain neutral DNA, which is how you actually show kinship in the first place. And so you could say that if you wanted to. Okay. Um, from Ben, I may have been misunderstood. The study by Ann Fritkowska seems to show IQ is a good indicator of success in life. Are you saying this is erroneous? I don't think anybody here has said that. Okay. Um, from Vashvan, in out group Q means more non whites equals less voting for their interests of white people. Timmy, whites are the only race voting for their for other races' benefits. Okay. Uh, just keep going. So, all right, guys, you can go. Uh -huh, if you want. I just wanted to say that I mean, I. Uh, well, so, so the situation again is, is that white people coming here vote for the party, which I think is, is sort of advocating for the interests against white people. So that to to break it down that way is is a little um, like it, it does the the solution is not that so And also, when and this is I don't know I feel weird sort of talking about this from the left of what I think maybe the motivation behind the question is, but. Like the, 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 I think I said this in my opening statement that the white people in America should be having a conversation about how to deal with the fact that we're becoming an ethnic minority and not about whether or not it's a good idea to become an ethnic minority because we are a minority among people under the age of 16. If you think you can stop it from happening, I, I think you're out of your mind. Also, technically, so how to deal with it. I feel like in most of these conversations, we point out that uh, Asian people get the short end of the stick when it comes to things like affirmative action. But Asian people also overwhelmingly vote Democrat. So couldn't we argue that Asian people vote against their inter their racial interests as well? Or are there other interests besides affirmative action that we're worried about? Well, I, th I think that, the, well, A, it's not, I don't think, super clear that Asians get screwed, especially by affirmative action. Um I mean, we can talk about some of the, the research on that because there was a lot of attention given to Harvard recently, obviously, about this. But if you look at the research, Harvard is an exception to the general rule in U.S. colleges in the degree to which they seemingly discriminate against Asian Americans. Um, I thought that I my personal background is this is I just had an Asian friend that got into law school and she was telling me that for it's something I, I fuck I don't remember this, but I think it was like a 10 to 15 point gap on the LSAT was needed all else equal, I think, for an Asian to get into some of these like good law schools versus a white person. I, maybe she was exaggerating. Maybe she was just salty. That was my takeaway from it, though. I thought I looked it up and it was true. Um, I mean, I try to right. So so there's there's definitely a variation across school and across school types. Um, I, I made a, a table in, in an article I wrote once about all the studies on this that I could find. I don't, I think I want to say it was about 30 effect sizes, something like this. And as I recall, the median effect for Asian Americans was very close to zero in terms of, um, the increase in probability of someone getting admitted into a school, uh, over a white person controlling for all their qualifications. Okay. Um, from Chief Trumpster, what is Destiny's ideal number of immigrants per year and skill level breakdown? I have not yet again and provided an exact answer for that. Like I said, like my general idea would be I would hope that people are selecting for um, like economic opportunity and insofar as they're doing so, as long as they come to the United States and they can work in the United States, I think it's cool that they come to the United States and work in the United States. I, but I can't tell you like, oh, like we need approximately 285,000 low skill workers. We need about 150,000 high skill workers. Like I, I, don't, I don't have those exact numbers in my head. I can't do that. Um, my, my only goal would be that People are coming here and they're selecting for economic reasons and not for welfare related reasons. Okay. Um, from the Law of Averages, would love to see Sean versus Destiny on systemic racism, like the debate Destiny did against AJW. Okay. Uh, let's see. From Dark Shadow Realm, Little Timmy exists. He has friends of all races at school. 
And he goes home and plays Fortnite with them. That's the case for 99% of white kids today. Wow. Okay. <laughs> From Dark Shadow Realm. So how do low IQ people gain success? I read that about 10% of the U.S. has very low IQ. As jobs get more and more advanced, how do we help these people? Uh, I think in that question yeah, is that question. like a really cancerous uh, American thing is baked into that in terms of finding success. Uh, I think that in the Western world, I actually shouldn't say that, in America, in the United States of America, we hyper fixate on income and material status. And I think that when you look at it that way, like who can find success is going to start to vary in, in ways that is not only like probably like unhealthy for the political discourse, um, it's it's unhealthy on a macro level because it's not how we should define success, right? Like success should be that you are happy in life. Ideally, you would find like a partner and maybe you'd have a family, maybe you'd work a job and you would have a hobby. And like, these are like what makes a person successful and a lot of friends. Um, this idea that like success is um, you survive high school and you survive college and you're not ODing on SSRIs or committing suicide because you're so depressed. And then you get into like a big law firm and you're making 150 a year working 80 hours a week until you're 34 and then you have your first kid and then you divorce your wife because you all fucking hate each other. And you like, I don't think that's success. And that type of lifestyle, a low IQ person probably won't get. If you're 80 IQ, you're probably never gonna to get the chance to uh, become old, white, wealthy, and then kill yourself out of loneliness, right? So I, I think that, that the, the framing of that question of like, how do these low IQ people become successful? Anybody in life can reasonably be successful. Even people with severe disabilities can be successful. We just need to, I think we should rethink how we define success and stop correlating it so much with your income level and your material wealth. Um, from Cheesy S, question for Destiny. What does he think about Biden's PPP? which puts all white applicants at the bottom of the list. Um, the PPP, the, um, I don't even remember the, the, what it stands for. The, the business loans, the small business loans, the Paycheck Protection Program, I don't, did that, I don't think that put white applicants at the bottom of the list. I'd never heard that in my life. I think the Farm Bill did, but not the uh, PPP. I, I mean, I applied for the PPP and I, I got it just fine. So I don't, I've never heard of that, that there was a racial bias in the PPP. I've never heard that ever in my life. That's the first time I've heard that before. From Chief Chumpster, given a recent CBO that showed immigrants had a net negative impact on wages in low middle class, does the U.S. government have a duty to limit immigration to help Americans? I mean, I, I think that any time you're looking at an economic transaction, you always have to look at all the different sides of it, and then we can make a a guess based on that. So anytime you're having some people that might be getting paid a lower wage, then this also means that there should be some capital owner or investor that's being, um, that's getting more money off of that. Um, and ideally you should have some um, transactor on the other side that's getting a better deal out of that. So a consumer that's buying a good or service. Um, I mean, what ought are, uh, you know, what is like the ideal amount of workers to, you know, job positions? I, I don't know what the answer is to that. Uh, generally, the argument that I've heard is that growing the overall size of the economy is more important than trying to artificially restrict the supply in some sectors just to raise, um, you know, wages or costs in a particular area. But we need to do a better job in the United States at redistributing stuff because we're really bad at that right now. So what happens is, is you'll get people that will come in, you'll get immigrants that will come in, that will get jobs that will probably depress wages in certain sectors or from certain groups of people. And the only people that can take advantage of that are business owners that are overwhelmingly wealthy or like big consumers or big spenders that are also overwhelmingly wealthy. So other people in the country just get fucked with no redistributive effect towards them. And then they're like, okay, well, this sucks. From um, Wilson, I empathetically reject the worldview of bread tube and their ilk. Why should people diametrically opposed to each other vie to rule over each other? Let's just peacefully separate. We don't demand couples stay in toxic situations. Okay. okay. Good luck. Um, I don't know. <laughs> all right. Uh, let's see here from a nice guy. Watch Ghoulie 333 vid, footnotes, nationalism. It answers Destiny's question on national political identity formation, white identity, US versus EU. That's great. Okay. Hold on one second. Mm -hmm. um, let me see if we have stuff for you then. Hmm. I can just read the troll ones that are going for him now. <laughs> um, maybe I'll do that while he's gone. <laughs> 
Yeah, this way we yeah. can get him in. Yeah. Yeah. Hydro. Brittany, would you date Destiny if knowing he sucks cack just to please his girlfriend? Okay. Got <laughs> that, that in. <laughs> What? <laughs> Maybe I like doing it because I like doing it. Who says anything about my girlfriend? Maybe I'm secretly uh, a gay person and I'm just waiting for the right time to come out of the closet. Headphones, bro. How did you hear it without headphones? Yeah. Wait, I, but they're headphones. They're open air headphones. I can hear them all over my fucking apartment. So close. <laughs> all right. All right. Never mind. <laughs> From a uh, posh fan, Destiny, is it realistic to expect immigrants to not vote for the party, bringing all their friends and family here? They'll choose economic policy over family. P people vote. Uh, voting is a very is in some ways very complicated and in other ways very simple. Um, it, it's just it doesn't work. It's just not that simple that like, oh, my God, like all the immigrants are going to vote um, to bring more immigrants over. I, like, I don't think it's that simple. I think people vote for a wide variety of reasons. And I think it's good to look at that. Right. You, arguably, I would say that Trump's rhetoric once he got elected was probably some of the craziest, like build the wall, build the wall. Like, you know, no, nobody from shithole countries like that I have ever heard, at least in my lifetime. And he did way better with Hispanic voters than the Democratic Party thought that he was, which and there's like a multitude of examples where people vote on people will vote very differently depending on like where they are, who they are, the, t the types of issues that are being talked about. Uh, I don't think it's as simple as like immigrants vote for more immigrants. Okay. Um, I wanted, I wanted to say on that topic that um, Hispanics vote Democrat even when they are border restrictionists. Um, that if you look at Hispanics who say that immigration should be reduced by a lot, they still net vote Democrat. And moreover, there have been studies done on the effectiveness of Republican outreach where they try to go and say, oh, actually, I'm a pro-immigration Republican. Do Hispanics tend to vote more for them? And the results of that uh, are not encouraging for uh, that being a, a Republican strategy to just gain the Hispanic votes by just singularly coming out in favor of immigration. Yeah, vote, voting is like really complicated across a lot of different groups. It's never just like one issue across all groups like that. Well, it's also like voting. I think probably the most important thing for voting, the determinant of voting, is just momentum. So it's an amazing thing that if you um, if you look at studies that try to determine predict how someone is going to vote, and they include a bunch of the demographic variables, and they ask them about their political ideology and their preference and all these different uh, specific issues and whatnot, the amount of variation in uh, party ID that that explains is much less than half. It, the vast majority of the variation is explained by something else. And in large part, I think what that is, is just this momentum of I vote this way because uh, my family voted this way, grandparents voted this way, this is how the people around me vote. It has nothing to do with even like con it, it, the specific contents of my individual mind in a sense. Mm -hmm. um, from Revolt Rise, Sean, how do you feel about immigration from Latin American countries? where the population is overwhelmingly conservative, like the millions who voted Trump in Texas in 2020. Okay, but the Hispanics in Texas did not on net vote Trump. Um, when, and Hispanics that come, so uh, groups change culturally when they come here. There are a lot of groups in, in America that come from countries that are very uh, conservative policies by by some of our measures and once they move here they move to the left socially quite a lot um asian americans are i if i recall right the most extreme example of this that uh asian americans that come from countries where like gay marriage and abortion things like this are are outlawed will, will come here and very quickly assimilate into the sort of left-wing view on the social issues uh, and to some extent, the same is true of Hispanics. There are some groups that have like ideological protectors against this. The major one being Muslims, who tend to stay fairly socially conservative, and who before nine eleven voted uh, Republican, incidentally. Okay. Um, let's see here. Oh, I can pull this one up from Bash Bash. Sean, do you cope with the effect of iodine uh, deficiency on IQ that can drop it by 12 points? Lack of nutrition affects especially third world countries. Sure. So, so there are a few uh, there are a few different different things to say about that. Um, in the first place, if you're talking about third world countries, so the degree of the gap between African Americans and white Americans that is due to genes is not the same as the proportion of the gap between Africans and white Americans that is due to genes. Uh, I agree that 
things like malnutrition play a role in IQ gaps, especially if we're looking at international comparisons. However, uh, in the United States, we have estimates of the impact of various kinds of nutritional deficiencies in these gaps. Uh, a, they're very small in their effect on IQ uh, in, in, in terms of the explanation of the group difference. And, and B, you have to ask why that difference exists in the first place, because many environmental differences that do contribute to IQ gaps are themselves the effect in the first place of having a lower IQ and that having various socioeconomic ramifications. Um, in the international case, uh, we know, for instance, that uh, genes, which are correlated to thin population with IQ, continue to predict national IQ after you control for measures of things like national malnutrition rates. So anyone thinking that's like a very strong explanation, I, I think would be misguided. Okay. Um, from Flash Fan, isn't one problem that low IQ people becoming a majority, I'm not sure if I read this one, increase, a lot of them are very similar though, um, a majority increases crime, violence, and means high IQ people get killed, aka less people capable of fixing things. I don't know if I read that one, but it sounds sort of familiar. I think that in, um, I'm pretty sure that when it comes to victimization, I think it's generally like on, on like when it comes to violence. I don't think. I could be wrong on this, but because I've never read it specifically in IQ, but I don't think that like low IQ people run around killing high IQ people. I think that it's like generally like whatever groups exist in an area tend to victimize themselves. It's not, I don't, I don't think it is the other way, or at least I've never heard that before, if it is the case. Um, I'm starting to think this Vosh fan guy is not actually a Vosh fan. He's not sounding like <laughs> <laughs> well, give it away. <laughs> so th that is true in the majority of cases. I mean, it is worth saying that certain <laughs> racial groups have higher rates of like committing crime against out group members than others. But the, yeah, the majority of crime is among like people, racially and socioeconomically. Uh, from... uh, we can. Well, you have to oh, go like, in a bit. Huh? So if you wanted maybe. Um... Yeah, you oh, yeah, in about 10 minutes. Yeah, so Lovely. I don't know if you want um, me to keep going. I just want to go into closing statements. Um, well, maybe you could probably do a few more. These don't seem to be taking very long. All right, let me see um, if we can find something for you specifically. I could say about the, the criminality thing, um, because a lot of people, I think, have a misguided view on the relationship between demographic change and criminality that... Uh, if you look at immigrants in the United States, they it's somewhat hard to measure their crime rates. But so far as we can tell, they tend to have fairly low crime rates. Uh, importantly, this is this has been true for like ever, basically for a very long time. This has been true. Uh, there are some myths about the crime rates of immigrants in the early 20th century, uh, and that the ethnic differences in crime rates persist when you control for immigration status. And what I mean by that is, for instance, if you look at so in America. Native Hispanics have, have higher crime rates than do native whites. Also, immigrant Hispanics have higher crime rates than do immigrant whites. Uh, the reason for this is not totally clear, but it may have something to do with the incentive structure of being an immigrant and being that, that created an added pressure to not commit crime. But because these Hispanic populations who, when they came here as immigrants, had lower crime rates, set up a population which then had a higher crime rate, I think that uh, the the legitimacy of the concern about criminality stemming from immigration is sometimes underappreciated. I think that that's a really complicated question to answer because you also have to keep in mind that if immigrant Hispanics are immigrating here and then they are committing more crime, if that if that increase in crime is just coming up to what the national average is, that's something that would kind of be expected. Now, if it's getting higher, that's something to look at as well. Um, <clears throat> we would have to dig into particular studies further. So I used to be of the mindset that immigrants uh, seemed to commit more crime than native people, uh, because I, I think that for a while, at least, the data seemed to overwhelmingly support that. And then I think it was the Cato Institute. I don't know how we feel about them here. Maybe we hate them here. But um, I think the Cato Institute broke apart a lot of these crime rates by race which makes, or not by race, I'm sorry, by age, which makes sense because like the, the majority of your crime committing years are gonna be like in your teens and early 20s. It's very, very rare that we're getting people like in their mid to late 40s or 50s, like out robbing stores, doing violent crime. That's exceptionally rare. So when you have a really young immigrant population coming in, and the age of this group on average is so much lower. If you don't actually start breaking apart the age groups, it, it's just expected that they're going to have a much higher propensity for crime per capita, um, just because of how much younger that demographic is compared to the one being compared to like white people. 
So that is definitely true, but it is important to note that, and again, this is not specifically looking at immigrants. This is looking at the domestic uh, sort of standing Hispanic population that has come to exist via immigration in the United States. Um, like the incarceration rate of young Hispanic males is several times that of young white males, and the Hispanic rate of, of homicide, which is something that hopefully there's less concern about police bias with respect to the sort of reporting of the rates, uh, even adjusting for age is like twice as high. So that uh, th th there is a concern there, I think. Um, we did actually have one question for you um, from Dark Wizard. Ask Sean about the correlation between IQ and success in the Soviet Union and post-Soviet Union Russian Federation changed. I'm not the association between IQ and success. So what I'm familiar with is maybe he's just talking about a paper I haven't read, but I'm familiar with this change in the heritability of IQ. So that uh, the heritability of IQ increased after the Soviet Union ended, and that's not surprising if you create a more meritocratic system, um, then the heritability of traits is going to tend to rise. And there's, there's evidence from that in various different contexts and, and countries. Although there's also a meme that within nations like the United States, low socioeconomic status, people have a higher, a lower heritability of IQ, and that's uh, almost definitely not true. Um, all right. I mean, I guess you can go into uh, close this thing because you're going to have to leave in a bit, and I could just finish reading some of these after if you want to do that. Unless you want me to keep going. Uh, sure, we could do that. Uh, since I did the first opening statement, do you want to do the first closing, or do you have a preference? Um, I, I mean, uh, yeah. Um, I, we talked about a lot of stuff. Um, I don't think we hit on too many areas of like extreme disagreement. Um, I think our the, realist closing statement. <laughs> yeah, the I think the the extreme disagreements that we're probably going to have are, are probably going to be on the interpretation or on like which studies we're selecting to say how much is like a, a genetic factor when it comes to things like crime or IQ. Um, but that would be like a very particular conversation over very particular datum and um, or over very particular data. Um, I, I think broadly, prescriptively, surprisingly enough, we, we might agree on most things. Um, if there are environments that can be improved, we should obviously improve them. Um, if there are genetic factors at play, we shouldn't be scared to explore them because otherwise we're going to be trying to answer questions or problems that are, are, we're not understanding. Um, <clears throat> I think that trying to form, I guess, the and, and, and then one big thing we hit in is I don't think you can form like a white identity group in the United States. I think that there are too many different groups of white people. Same thing with groups of Hispanic people, group of African-American or black people. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I guess that's all I got. Okay, Sean. Uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, it, it seems like we ended up discussing primarily things that are a little downstream of the, the fundamental disagreement. Um, but what, what can you do? Uh, but, but yeah, I think that even if we agree on the ifs, the, the fact that we probably do have very different views about the actual degree of genetic contribution is going to lead to a big difference in, in the things, A, in the things that we, we, we think should be happening, how problematic we think things like affirmative action are and all that sort of thing. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I'm not good at closing statements, so <laughs> I'm just going to leave it there. All right, well, I mean, yeah, this, uh, this was a very friendly debate, you guys. Good boys. <laughs> so, yeah, I guess thank you um, for coming on, Sean. And, um, yeah, we're going to we're gonna keep going because we have some more Super Chats, but I just know that you had, to, you had to leave at a specific time. So. Yep, and this is just about when I got to <laughs> go. But, uh, yeah, th thanks for uh, having me on. And maybe we can uh, do this again sometime with a more – pointed <laughs> yeah. question that we definitely can can hash out very strong disagreements about around these areas because there obviously are some uh but, but in any case yeah thanks for uh doing the debate uh goodbye yeah. thanks sean <laughs> mm, okay mm, i don't know why don't you thank um, me for coming on what the fuck you're still here <laughs> you're yeah. still here brother <laughs> you're still here um, yeah, yeah, whatever, we're gonna dude. run you through the ringer a little more all right oh, so boy. wait all right um salicon to destiny is league a form of collective suicide maybe okay uh ah oh, damn it I missed one for him <laughs> what is your favorite color of nationalism sorry uh let's see what else we have for you i'll wait to read that one uh from Tom Toms, please ask Destiny. Sweden has had 120 bombings through July this year. Is this a normal for Sweden? 
And if not, what caused the change of hundreds of bombings? Um, like maybe, probably gang violence would be my guess. I don't, I don't know as much about <clears throat> uh, Swedish crime. I'm not Swedish, not yet. Isn't your, isn't your fiance like Swedish? Yeah. What do you think that means? I know every fucking thing about Sweden. Well, maybe. Well, <laughs> a no. lot of stuff. So yeah, random shit. I've heard that there's like <clears throat> usually when immigrants come in, um, especially in Sweden, it's usually gang violence is what's causing the increase. It's not like 120. I don't know if it's 120 bombings. That sounds high. Maybe it is. Or maybe it depends on how you define a bombing. But it's usually gang violence. It's not like people running around like doing terrorist attacks on schools or whatever. But uh, not that it's a good thing. Of course, it's bad as well. You hopefully wouldn't have this type of violence. But yeah, I heard that like. Um, I don't I think this is true. I heard that in the like 2013 or something. I think there was a um I think there was a big crate of hand grenades that police thought was shipped into the country. And a lot of the bombings in the country can be traced back to like that one big shipment of hand grenades. And for some reason a ton of people got their hands on. I don't know why or how that happened, but I I've I've read that before. I know why. I think he was definitely talking about the migration. Um <clears throat> Uh, we got a troll question for you from Spook Trick Roper. How many days meth free? Okay. Um, let's see here. We have from from Bosch Van. <laughs> Is it realistic to use logic to convince low IQ, low impulse control people to vote different? The left seems to just stoke emotion, BLM, TDS, etc. I mean, everybody stokes emotion. That's politics 101. To pretend like like, like one guy is not doing it like republicans are the bastion of rationality and and democrats are all appealing to fear i mean like both sides can play up fears in different ways yeah and have played up fears in different ways so, yeah. well there was a whole thing about um how your politics can shift based you become more conservative when you are scared and you become more liberal when you feel safe so Potentially. Like People tend to look that. inwardly when things get scary, right? We yeah, want to be so more protectionist. Yeah. So. I mean, it kind of shows with uh, with COVID because, you know, for Democrats, Democrats were a lot more scared of it and they became very conservative. And conservatives seem to be not. So they maybe more liberal. Wait, um, can you read that question one more time? Hold on. What was that question one more time? Oh God, let me see if I lost it. Was it do Democrats pander to like fear or emotion or whatever? Was that? Okay, I, I, I think I undeleted it. Hold on, let me see. Yeah, they, cause, cause they stoke fears like with BLM and TDS, right? Okay, okay, so is it realistic to use logic to convince low IQ, low impulse control people to vote different? The left seems to just stoke emotions, BLM, TDS. Okay, yeah, okay, sorry, because I see you, there's a guy in your chat, Vosh fans, Destiny will just say everyone does it to avoid the question. It's not to avoid the question. I'm just showing you your question is insanely fucking dishonest. Like, do Democrats stoke fear? Yeah, of course. When you say shit like, oh, if you're black and you're outside, every fucking cop is looking to assassinate, that's stupid as fuck, and the left absolutely harps on that. But when you've got Trump on stage screaming, like MS-13, Mexicans coming to kill your fucking grandma, and we've got to close the border, all these terrorists are coming in, and we got to ban Muslim travel, all these terrorists. Like, that's absolutely stoking fear as well. Like, that's just politics 101. When you get people scared, you get them hyped up, and they want to go to the office, and they want to vote for shit. That's like one of the biggest ways to get people to turn out is to rile people up over fear of something, whether it's the economic damage caused by um, government intervention for the coronavirus, whether it's people dying from the coronavirus. Like, yeah, so it's a, it's a stupid fucking question, right? It's like saying, like, it, it would be like going into some, like, professional athletic event and be like, oh, Oh, I don't like that guy because he's fucking doping. Like, and that's horrible. Don't you agree that he's doping? Yeah, everybody's fucking doping, bro. Of course, right? Like, it's a stupid question. It's you're trying to point to one side having a problem when in reality it's just all part of the game. Sorry, that's, well, that's stupid. That's like literally what happened. I think with me with immigration. I mean, the reason I've gotten so conservative on it is because it's through fear. Um, so, I, and that's what seems to be the case on. Well, but you can get to either system. side from fear, right? I mean, like, yeah. like Republicans play. Oh, wait, why are you admitting that you're scared and irrational? Though that doesn't make any sense. No, Should... I think no. I yeah, that's the whole. I literally said that that's the reason why I'm like gotten super conservative. I'm scared of a racial revenge. Okay, well, why the <laughs> fuck do you live in this place and you're going to other places that have like the highest fucking Hispanic people? Like, why not go north to like fucking <laughs> to where Bernie lives in Vermont or something? Then, if you're so worried about like immigration or whatever. What do you mean? Where am I going? <laughs> like, why not? Why not go to like a place that has less immigration if it's something that's like genuinely a big concern for you? Like where? Like Vermont or Minnesota or North Dakota <laughs> or Wyoming or like any of these other like ninety nine point nine 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 percent white places. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Okay. All right. <laughs> She's like, now that you mention it. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me see what else we have here. Uh, from. 
floop. Is Destiny willing to debate people who are educated on the Jewish Masonic questions, such as Dennis Wise? Yes or no? If I can like get, I, I have to get like a whole handle on their positions before it's, beforehand. And then if I'm feeling, if I have a trip coming up and I want to read for eight hours on a plane, I'll do it. I just have to know like, I have to know the subject beforehand because doing conspiracy theories in real time is just, is literally some of the most HIV inducing shit I've ever had to do in my entire life. Cause like when somebody's like, look at this picture, like this guy is related to Xinjiang's fucking uncle who like was next to George Soros when he was in the Illuminati ritual in 1972 and this picture with Ray, it's like, I don't fucking know. I have no fucking idea, okay? Like, and I, so I have to take everybody at their word for everything and uh, yeah, if, if I have like a clear, like outlining of the topic beforehand and I know exactly, you know, what their beliefs are or whatever and I can do research beforehand, yeah, yeah, I probably would at this point. Fuck it. Okay. Uh, we get all this? Um, from Arcade Outpost is wait, it is planned orgs like HIAS who have their own political aims fund buttloads of immigrants into white countries. I, I'd be interested to see it, but it's almost always the case that when I look into shit like this, is just not true. The idea that there's some organization funding multiculturalism into some white country to weaken white power against Jewish people, I, I, it's just never the case. But, you know, I'll, I'll look into it. I won't, but... Okay. Uh, diddles... Somebody is saying, three. please spam Britney to check Twitter DMs. Thanks. Southern Dean Go wants you to know that in your chat. Uh, okay. Um... It's Dingo. Wait, oh, is it? Wait, did he say yeah. Southern Dingo? Yeah. He said check your DMs and Twitter. Okay. Um, oh, hey. <laughs> um, what did he say? So let me see if he wants me to read this. Uh, serious question for Destiny. Wait, hold on. He said he <laughs> make this motherfucker super chat to you guys. Why are you reading questions oh, for free? <laughs> what the fuck? Wait a minute. She still left this, bro. This bro, guy trying to get a pulled, free question in chat? Left. Unbelievable. Oh, I don't know if I want to read it actually because as I'm reading Bolshevik it, it might be a fucking... <laughs> better when you... No, I don't even think I'm going to read this anyways. <laughs> okay. All right. Good job. Um... <laughs> Let me take a minute to thank you, Destiny, because I was, it's its funny, I was going to foreshadow it. We hit 5K today, right? So right you gave us a shot. Yeah, right before we started. So it's kind of, uh, I don't know what you call that, uh, you know, whatever oh, it's just called. But thank you anyway. And uh, I disagree with most of your politics, but you gave us a shot. So thank you, brother. I don't know. I think he might agree with more than he thinks. I I don't oh, think you know how much I disagree with, but... Oh, it, in 10 years, yeah, he'll be totally MAGA. Just like yeah, you we'll will be see. MAGA too, Brittany. Yeah, we'll, see. <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, are there any issues that you're conservative on? Me? Yeah. Uh, it, it depends on who you ask. Oh, Rittenhouse. Uh, no, I mean, I believe in self-defense and shit. I think, I think that everybody would agree with my Carl Rittenhouse take if they knew the facts of the matter. But if that's all I'm going to say, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't want to rehash it. I'm sure. I also really but like anyway, guns. I think guns are super fun. I, I yeah, I'm, well, I'm excited yeah. when I move to Florida. I'm going to get a sick ass. Like, I want to do a big AR-15 like, build. Oh, well, yeah, I'm down here, bro. And let me tell you, it's like having two dicks, only you can kill somebody with one of them. Sure. Uh, that's owning guns. Gotcha. Okay. <laughs> I think that's pretty much all the questions. So um, you're free if you want to go. <laughs> Thank you for your for my freedom. Okay, have fun. <laughs> it's been fun. Stay safe. All right. Take it easy, bro. Okay. Okay. Yeah, be careful, bye. Okay, that was their fault for not having clearly set out a debate topic <laughs> because initially she mentioned like the Great Migration or no, it was the Great Replacement, but I guess neither of us felt too strongly about that topic. So it was, we kind of like circled around the race realist stuff, but I didn't have, I, like I, we have to get into like, what do you think about this and this and this? And we have to go through very specific studies to do that. And I'm not really ready to do it now. Um, to the other guy's credit, he didn't push hard on it. Um, the guy seemed like a pretty good faith interlocutor um, because I think if he really wanted to, he could have been like, well, what do you have to say about the fact that like black people are more aggressive and blah, 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 blah. And I wouldn't be able to counter that on the spot. I would have to like start going through data like super heavily to, to argue this. Um, so, wow, uh, it was a that was a conversation, not maybe the most productive conversation, but I find it funny. He seemed like he expected you to be triggered by his arguments and didn't and know no, how to I'm react not white anymore. Yeah, but I like I don't even necessarily blame him for that because like too much of like the left-leaning discourse has become way too dogmatic in terms of how we talk about different issues, and it's 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 exa it's just exhausting for me as a, probably as for some people on the right. Like oh you know like well what's going on with this? Thing? Oh it's all racism and it's like okay like bro. <laughs> 
we got we have to have a there's probably something else going here too right we need to like be able to have better conversations about this shit um and that gets frustrating so yeah i mean i i can empathize there at least destiny i have a question you said we'll answer a question on pp wait what is pp the measuring success on based on money is an American thing. We should stop doing that. I want to say two things. One, I don't think it's only an American concept. I think it's a global concept. And two, how else can we tangibly measure individual success if not through material success? Okay, one, okay, I'm going to speak in a very limited manner because I might be wrong on this, but it's not just an American concept. It seems to be in some cases like an American concept and like a Southeast Asian concept. These are the two places that I've seen it the most. So like, South Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, where there was like an obsession because like these, some of these places exploded so quickly and bit a lot of like American style, like liberalism, um, uh, like materialism, consumerism, all of that shit. Uh, this way, this might not even count as like Southeast Asia. I actually don't know where that region like begins and ends. Um, it, does, that might just include places like, does that include like, is it farther Southeast? Like Indonesia and shit? Okay, that maybe that actually I shouldn't say that. Um, is Taiwan considered Southeast Asia? Okay, the three countries that I'll say I guess I'll just say like South Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, like these places that exploded like very fast. These Asian countries, exploded. okay, East Asia, gotcha. Um, Vietnam, Laos, Thailand, Malaysia would be Southeast Asia. Okay, I can't speak to those. I don't have any experience with them. Whatever. Um, South Korea is like hyper obsessed or seems to be hyper obsessed um, with that type of stuff. Um, Taiwan, to some extent, did too, and so did... Uh, I don't have first-hand experience with Hong Kong, but I hear it's similar-ish there, where some of these Asian places that exploded very quickly um, be, have, like, a like, very big consumerist bend. Um, and, then, and then America. It's probably the case that in parts of Europe it's like this. At the very least, in northern... In Scandinavia, it doesn't be the same. There's this really weird... Where are you losers at? Where, what is the name of the Scandinavian concept that I'm thinking of? Where nobody's supposed to be better, kind of, or you're not very, you don't flaunt very much. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Oh, um, it might be, is it, is it Janten Loven? I don't know how to pronounce anything in Swedish. If it was Spanish, I could do it. Janten Loven. It's a fucking stupid language. <clears throat> Whatever, whatever this fucking word is, but there's like a culture of like, um, there, there's like, there's a culture in some of these countries, at least in the Nordic ones or the Scandinavian ones or the Nordic ones, um, where you're, you're supposed to be like more chill. You're not supposed to be like very flaunty of your wealth or you're not supposed to act like you're way better than other people. Um, I don't know how much that permeates every part of society, but it does seem to be the case to me that America is uniquely obsessed, obsessed with consumerism. Um, it, yeah, which I think is probably not... It's probably not good. Um, I've never heard this, Destiny, as a Swede. What the fuck is this? You must have heard this. I know you've heard this because I've heard this from three different Swedish people that I've never, ever... Oh, and actually, the, I so I met a girl. I've heard this from two different Swedish people, Melina and somebody else explained this concept to me. And then when I was in Sweden, I met a girl that was Norwegian and we hung out for a day and she explained it in words. She had a word for it. And I was like, oh shit, there's actually a word for that. So even Norwegian people know about this thing. And I've heard multiple Swedish people like, so you must know, you must know about this. Um, it's, th th it is a thing. Um, apparently it's Jantelagen and not Jantelagen. Okay, I don't know what the fuck it is. Oh, it's Law of Jant. Jante, whatever the fuck that is. Yeah. Um, stop bogging me down on this dumb fucking uh, technicality. Th th there's, you're not, you're supposed to be chill, okay? Um, it characterizes not conforming, doing things um, out of the ordinary, or being personally ambitious as unworthy and inappropriate. You're supposed to, like, chill and fit in, okay? Um, it's called Yontelagen. It only applies for boomers. Zoomers don't give a fuck. Okay, maybe it's, maybe it's a different culture. In America, when I was in school, let me, let me say that, when I was in school, because it might not be um, the same now for Zoomers, but when I was in school... People exclusively talked about how much money they would make. Like, what major do you want to be? Um, this major pays 60 a year. This major will pay 70 a year. This major averages 55 a year. This major is 100. Like, people would almost exclusively talk, unless you're, like, going into liberal arts or whatever. Like, people are obsessed with how much money they're going to make afterwards. And that obsession with, like, making money, moving to places where you can make the most money and all that, I don't think it's a good way to build your life or live your life. I think it's really cancerous. Or you want to be, yeah, like a vet and help dogs. <laughs> Not good. 
By the way, when he brought up the wine guard guy, that dude was not fired for just studying genetic differences. That dude said all sorts of crazy shit and even went on to praise full out what blown full out full out blown full blown out white nationalists. If you check Eric Laws, he posted a screenshot of an email he sent. Dude is unhinged. Fuck. Oh, I'll have to check later. Remember how weird it was being in Sicily and no one caring about what car they drove? The kind of car you drive is a pretty large status symbol where I come from. It's gross. Sure. It was Brett Weinstein. What do you, why do you keep saying that? I don't think that was... On the McKinsey study, summary why it's pretty bad and study where they couldn't replicate it. Oh, okay. So maybe it's not a good... I don't know if I trust this name, but... It was not Weinstein, it was Weingart. Yeah, I don't know why people like hear Brett Weinstein or Wein anything. Like, oh, it was Brett Weinstein. I don't, it wasn't Brett Weinstein. I know why he got fired from school. That sounds like private school flexing. Lots of kids wanting to go pro or become a rapper would be the public school equivalent. Oh, maybe. But even listen to rappers. I mean, it's the same thing, right? I think rap in some ways embodies like the hyper consumerist culture in the West as well, right? Um, where, you, you know, like what are your statuses? What, what is your show of wealth or, or what is your show of worth? It's always like wealth, houses, you know, cars and shit. Like, I feel like I've outpaced him.